Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Charting Progress, the Philippine economic history during the post-war era. I am Ana Gabrielle Seguera from the History Program of the University of Santo Tomas Faculty of Arts and Letters, your Master of Ceremonies for this afternoon. We are now live on the Talakasaysayan YouTube page for registered participants and the Facebook page of both USC Department of History and USD History Society. May I invite the viewers to join our Lord in His presence for the invocation by the USD Cars of Arts and Letters to be followed by the singing of the Philippine National Anthem. Señor 
Before we begin, I would like to orient everyone on the webinar guidelines. All students and faculty members are encouraged to, to participate in the discussion by asking relevant and brief questions to the presenters, as these questions will be answered during the open forum. Also, please do not forget to accomplish the evaluation form to get an e-certificate after the event. The link to the evaluation forms will be emailed to all registered par participants. So welcome us to this event. May I call on Ms. Calista Chavies Bravo, the class president of Three History and the co-project head of this event for our opening remarks. Thank you, Ms. Aguera, for that introduction. To all the students, professors, guest speakers, and beloved viewers who are all tuned in right now, good afternoon. On behalf of the USC History Society, it is my greatest pleasure to officially welcome you to this webinar about the Philippine economic history in the post-war era. The post-war era of the Philippines has been a topic that sparked interest among many scholars and historians. It was during this time that we, the Philippines, have been freed from the 40-year colonial chains of the United States. However, upon seeing the developments that transpired after World War II, scholars have argued that the social milieu of the independent Philippines did not significantly differ from the time that it was colonized. Both the political and economic structures that pervaded the American period have been retained in the Third Philippine Republic. More importantly, in the field of Philippine economic policies, American politics played a dominant role. The Philippine legislations have been framed to serve the primary interests of the United States over their own national interest. Through this webinar, the USC History Society aims to unveil scholarly insights of the Philippine economic state after it was granted independence. Progress viewed from the economic lens will help the students of history gauge how far the Philippines have gone in becoming an independent country. More, moreover, since economic history is also one of the undermined fields in the discipline, we also hope that this webinar would set forth this course and encourage a culture of research about the economic state of the post-war era in the Philippines. As we continue to widen our understanding about Philippine history, we must learn how to take the necessary steps that will help us achieve this goal. This webinar, as the organizers believe, is one of those significant steps. Once again, good afternoon, everyone, and we hope that our invited speakers for today will stimulate your interest in the historical discipline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Bravo. To formally introduce the first speaker, may I call on Mr. Malik Yukotongan, incumbent speaker of the USD History Society, legislator. Thank you, Gabby. It is my greatest pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker for this webinar is a graduate of Bachelor of Arts in History from the University of Santo Tomas and is currently finishing his Master of Arts in History degree in the same university. He formerly taught humanities and social science subjects in Chiang Kai-shek College, Lyceum of the Philippines University, University of Santo Tomas, Colegio de San Juan de Letran, Manila, and De La Salle College of St. Pinild. He is actively conducting research on topics related to Philippine economic history and economic nationalism. Currently, he serves as the managing editor of TALA, an online journal of history, and a faculty member of the Department of Arts and Sciences of Cavite State University, Carmona. Without further ado, let us welcome Mr. Miguel Antonio A. Jimenez. Hello, thank you very much for that introduction. So I also like to thank uh, the, UST, the UST History Society for inviting me as their guest speaker for uh, this afternoon and to give insights regarding the economic history of the Philippines. Okay, as you all know, I would like to um, support the opening remarks given by the class president that the economic history of the Philippines is actually uh, thought to us as something which is um, uh, in the, uh, being uh, having an independent stance or having independence is uh, the main idea of teaching economic history in the Philippines, especially in high school, where uh, when we got our independence in 1945, 
we did okay for the past years and today we're having a good economy. But actually, if we look into the true nature, the true setting of our uh, economy, uh, since we got our independence, there are slight uh, misunderstandings or miseducation on the part of uh, the economic history of the Philippines. So the topic or the paper that I will present is about the making of a neo-colonial state. So, madalas, the term neo-colonialism or imperialism is be uh, is present sa mga kalye. Sometimes you will see the term imperialism sa mga placards, di ba? And sometimes we attribute it to the red, di ba? May, may, may red tagging sa word na neo-colonialism or sa... Uh, imperialism and globalists see this as what anti-globalization it is a propaganda against anti-colonial uh, 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 anti-globalization but it's not because for the past years after our independence we, we could see that all of the almost all of the treaties all of the um relations that we built with other countries, especially the United States, made made us what a a an economy of just a supplier of raw materials to other industrialized countries. And as we all know, even if the data showed to us that the economies progresses about over time, if uh, you would see that in reality. There is poverty. There is hunger. Right? And that's what Alejandro Lichaco, uh said in his book, uh, Hunger, Corruption, and Betrayal, that even though uh, we see that there is progress in the manufacturing industry and, and the data shows that we're having progress in many sectors of our economy, the real, uh, the real indicator of progress is the livelihood of the people. So, the making of a neo-colonial state. So, what is neo-colonialism? The first question is, do we know? Uh, we, we always see it. We all we always use the term neo-colonialism in terms of our relations with other powerful countries, especially. And it came from the word colonialism. As we all know, uh, when we say colonialism, it's a traditional way of uh, uh, taking over a, a another independent country uh, through the use of force. But there's a term neo here, because as we all know, uh, by the time na dumating yung 1900s, there's uh, there's a shift in the strategy of controlling other countries, especially when former colonies were granted or acquired their independence. Okay, so neo-colonialism. This uh, this definition could be seen in uh, Alejandro Lechalco's book. The uh, hunger, corruption, and betrayal. So first, the first definition of neocolonialism is the policy of a strong nation in seeking political and economic hegemony over independent nation or extended geographical area without necessarily reducing the subordinate nation or area to the legal status of a colony. And through this definition, medyo maguguluan siguro ang tao. <laughs> Maybe that's the nature of people that if it's wordy, pag wordy siya, mas mahirap siya maintindihan. So, the Chao Ko used uh, the second definition to simplify the first one. So it is the exploitation of a supposedly independent region or nation as by imposing a puppet government. So do we have a puppet government? That's the first question now. Do we have a puppet government? Is there an exploitation of other countries sa ating bansa ngayon? Especially today, diba? the stance or the image being projected by the government is that uh, they are charting a, an independent foreign policy, independent economic policy. But is it true? Or is, is it just a facade to, uh, to hide the true nature of our economic and diplomatic policies? So, the economic history of the Philippines started, okay, we'll, natin. actually, if you will take economic history, 
uh, sometimes mabobrot out yung, for example, the Spanish period, uh, of course, the uh, kind of uh, trade na ginawa ng pre-colonial times. But the actual Philippine economic history and talagang starting point niya is when the Philippines got independence in 1946. Diba? And this is a part of the Declaration of Independence read by Paul McNutt uh, sa Luneta eh, during the uh, uh, during the granting of independence on in July 4. Okay? So whereas the Act of Congress approved March 24 known as the Philippine Independence Act directed that on Mar 4th day of July immediately following in 10-year transitional period Commonwealth Leading to the independence of the Philippines, the President of the United States of America should, by proclamation, withdraw and surrender all rights of, of possession, supervision, jurisdiction, control, or sovereignty of the United States of America in and over the territory and the people of the Philippines. Pero siguro na overlook ito, except certain reservations therein and thereafter authorized to be made. And on behalf of the United States, uh, Baba tayo, na konti. Of course, nakita na natin so, but uh, United States of America hereby withdraws and surrender all rights of possession, supervision, jurisdiction, control, or sovereignty now existing and exercised by the United States of America. But again, there's a slight line there na medyo sketchy. <laughs> Except certain reservations therein and thereafter authorized to be made. And before July 4, may something na nangyari. Okay? Before before July 4, and bago pa maging independent ang Pilipinas at bago pa mag ang independence, may mga machinations ng ginawa ang United States to may plan na sila to really uh, make the Philippines still a colony of of the United uh, of them. Okay? So, now, bakit ngayon ang 1946? Kaya nga, ang tingin ng mga tao dito sa 1946 um, independence, eh, hindi siya masyado kinikilala at mas kinikilala natin yung, yung 1897. Uh, ay, sorry. Uh, 1898 na 1898 na independence because the 1946 independence was granted. Okay? Unlike the other one, pinaglaban mo yan. And there's no independence na hindi pinaglalaban yan. Okay? Mas masarap pakinggan at mas masarap lagi kapag ang iyong kasarinlan ay nakuha mo sa de ba lahat naman ng bagay kapag pinaghihirapan yun talaga yung mas kinikilala mo and there's no independence na but na kinagran siya because there's always a struggle in achieving independence okay now aning mga machinations ano ba yung first step na ginawa ng United States in sustaining the status of the Philippines as a neo colony uh, first as Una is, of course, extending aid in the Philippines. Aid yung unang, isa sa unang instrumento nila. Okay? The U.S. motivation in extending aid in the Philippines is through what? Humanitarian, political, economic, and military. Bago yung mga laws, aid muna. Napakaganda kasi ng konteksto ng Pilipinas eh, nang binigyan siya ng kasaritlan. When, by the time the Philippines was given an independ uh, independence, we all know that it was, what? Heavily damaged during the war. And, what, after a year? and uh, After ma uh, months lang, binigyan mo agad ng independence ang Pilipinas. That's a good opportunity for America to, who is the victorious, di ba? As we all know, who was victorious during the Second World War. Yun ang magandang opportunity para ma, ma, makuha nila or mapatagal nila ang kanilang control sa Pilipinas. So, U.S. motivations are extending aid to the Philippines. Number one, as we all know, human, it's for humanitarian reasons. The imperialist, uh, United States is advocating what we call welfare, welfare imperialism. Diba? Laging na lang, it's always the idea of the whites or the Americans that the world need them and that they are here to um, somewhat create balance, to protect freedom and protect the rights of the people even if they are not the citizens of the United States. Or parang that is their right. So, it's for the humanitarian cause. Uh, they always say that this aid ah, para makatulong sa inyo yan. Second, as you all know, political. Diba? These aids were used to control and to manipulate diba? the 
the leaders during that time, as, as we all know, the leaders during that time, they don't know. They're pressured. The pressure is always on rehabilitation. That's the first step, eh? rehabilitation. And you have no money. Your industries are what? Your industries are destroyed during the war. Your roads were destroyed. Bomb, diba? Or buildings were raised to the ground. Sinuno, diba? So, politically speaking, through this one, you were able, actually, connectado and political and economic because you have no means to generate income and to rehabilitate your country, you will have the opportunity to control the politics. Okay? Third, sa economic, as you all know, trade. Napakalaga ng Pilipinas na, as a trading partner of the United States. Why? Uh, because eh, the Philippines for so many years has been the market for the surplus goods of the uh, United States. Kaya nga, kahit napakalayo ng Pilipinas, kaya napakalayo ng Pilipinas, eh, um, di, ano yan, uh, kinuha pa rin siya. It's because it is a possible market for um, for surplus goods. Especially, di ba, and pansinin nyo, archipelagic ang Pilipinas, pero uh, what has been done is that patag tayo ng patag ng mga lupa. It's because, for example, yung mga kotse, isa yung mga unang pinadala, eh, isa yung mga unang uh, pinadala dito sa Pilipinas eh, para ibenta the surplus yung cars uh, surplus cars ng United States so economic the Philippines is a good uh, market for the industrial goods especially the surplus goods of the United States and fourth military defense because of the strategic location of the Philippines it could give uh, a good uh, uh, the United States could create a good defensive outpost doon sa, uh, uh, sa Pilipinas uh, as a defense doon sa may Pacific side. Diba? Kaya nga meron ka mga military basis agreements. Sabihin ng Pilipinas, eh, tutulungan. Pero actually, the first, uh, the priority here is, of course, the defense of the United States. Okay? Now, what are the types of economic aid? Yung mga aid na sinasabi natin dito, is meron din yung mga classifications, yung economic aid. Kasi minsan baka mamaya mag magugulat kayo bakit parang nag-iiba yung aid na ibinibigay sa atin. So, the two types of economic aid that were extended by the United States by the United States to the Philippines is one, rehabilitation aid, which was given to fund the rehabilitation program of the Philippines after its destruction during the war. So, after the war from 1946 to uh, 1948, 1949, yung mga aid na ibinibigay sa Pilipinas, that, yung mga tawag doon ay rehabilitation aid. Okay? Now, to bolster the economy, once na medyo naayos na natin yung economy, nakapag-set na, nakapag up na tayo ng ibang industriya, dumami na yung mga businessmen, medyo nakaraos na. Medyo? Hindi ko sinabi nakaraos na. Medyo. We're now being granted what we call developmental aid. Or these were given to bolster the economy of the Philippines. Okay? So, so, yung rehabilitation for the first three years, ito yung in-extend sa atin, then transition, developmental. Okay? So, mapapansin nyo yan uh, kapag nagbasa kayo ng mga uh, economic, uh, uh, economic history books, especially on the Philippine economic history, na minsan nagbabago yung terminologies, okay, on aid. So, this is the reason. Because yung purpose ng aid, nagbabago din. Okay? Now, it is... Another factor is the Belt Trade Act or another machination done by the United States to maintain the Philippines as a neo-colonial state is, now, is the Belt Trade Act. So, this was passed July 2, 1946. Okay? July 2. Nangyari siya July 2, 1946. Two days before the granting of the independence. Okay? This was sponsored by Charles Jasper Bell or Charles Jasper Bell. It was supported by... Ambassador, naging ambassador to after ng independence. Ambassador of uh, the United States to the Philippines, Paul McNutt, and as we all know, Millard Tidings, the, the author of the Tidings Rehabilitation Act, at the same time, the Tidings McDuffie, kaya nagkaroon ng independence. And ano nga bang nialaman ng Bell Trade Act? What is so what is so questionable dito sa Bell Trade Act? Siguro naririnig to. For, the, for the history majors, siguro uh, alam na Alam na nila to, pero for others na medyo hindi pa familiar, so what is the Bell Trade Act? So the Philippine Trade Act of 1946 or the Bell Trade Act, okay, 
these are some of the pertinent articles or uh, essential articles for you to understand. Ano nga ba talaga ni Alaman neto? And why is it? Why are the nationalists or why were the nationalists against the Philippine Trade Act? This act, bakit nga ba siya sinasabi na lopsided uh, trade um, uh, trade act between the two countries, the United States and the Philippines? So Article 1, U.S. exports to the Philippines and Philippine uh, exports to uh, sorry exports to the United States with the exception of those Philippine exports covered in Article Two shall pay no duty until July 4, 1954. Okay, so eight years. That was duties on this item shall be, then be five percent of the regular duties from July 4 to December 31, 1954. Ten percent during calendar year 1955 and five percent more of the regular duties. So. There is a gradual, um, may gradual na pag impose ng tariff. Gradual. Ngayon, all the people would say na, okay, this is good because wala tayong industriya and uh, saan ka makakaiultim mo pagawa ng sabon? Medyo problemado nga tayo dun. So, in the, good, uh, in the good side, sasabihin ng ibang tao na, okay, meron kang mga pangangailangan na may bibigay mo. So, may mga bagay na may uh, na makukuha mo outside dahil hindi mo kaya i-create inside. Uh, so, makakuha mo siya duty-free. At kapag duty-free yan, mas mababa ang presyo. But again, papaano naman yung kabilang side? Because as we all know, sino nga ba talaga ang pinakapanalo dito? Walang businesses. Sira, abagsak ang ekonomiya mo. And walang pera ang tao. And during the time, these people are what? claiming eh magki-claim pa lang sila ng mga damages na uh, na part ng Philippine Rehabilitation Act magki-claim pa lang sila so wala pang means to generate income therefore the 8 years is parang buffer yan para kumita agad so mag by the time na mag-impose ka na ng taripa mo ng mga susunod na taon and it's gradual by the time na ganun kumita na ng sobra si Kabila okay the other side Eh, kumita na siya. Well, the other one, na, magsisimula pa lang siyang mag-create eh, at the same time, andun pa yung competition. And as we all know, yung competition, medyo yan yung pinakamahirap pagdating sa, ano, people would say that competition is good, but at the same time, it is not good if the competition is between an established foreign business versus a local business na kakasimula pa lang. Okay? So, Article 2. Absolute quotas are placed on the amount of sugar, cordage, rope, rice, rice cigars, scrap, to tobacco, uh, coconut oil, and buttons of pearls or shells that can enter the U.S. from the Philippines. Second part is for the cigars and buttons. I miss my special dito. The importation into the U.S. shall be duty-free until July 4, 1954. And then a decreasing percentage of the import shall, shall be duty-free each year. So, number three, quotas. So, actually, Article 2 is all about Quotas yan. Okay? Pag sabi natin quotas, there are just a, a specific number of exports that will be allowed to enter the American uh, the American economy or the American market. So sir, bakit nga ba nagkakaroon ng quotas? Bakit nga ba mahalaga ang quotas? Mahalaga ang mga quota because this is a protective measure uh, done by the United States to protect the uh, industries, especially yung mga agricultural sector. Hindi, because uh, by imposing quotas, you you limit the competition. Hindi ka nakipag-compete kasi baka mamaya yung competition, mag-backfire yan. Baka mamaya kasi mag-backfire yan eh. Na mas maganda yung mas maganda yung mga crops dito sa Pilipinas, mas maganda yung mga agricultural products sa Pilipinas. So, the people would what? And the American citizens would opt to buy more agricultural products of the Philippines rather than the, of the Americans. So this is a protective measure uh, done by the United States to protect their agricultural industry. Actually, later on, naging manufacturing na rin. So Article 3, the U.S. may establish quotas on imports of other Philippine articles imported to the U.S. if the U.S. President determines that these articles substantially compete. Ito yung sabi sa inyo kanina. So, who determines, sino nagde-determine ng pagbabago sa trade relations? If it is equal, of course, the Philippine president should also have the say on this um, trading, uh, on this act or on this law. But 
lumalabas, only the United States President ang meron lang kakayahan na baguhin ito. This is July 2 and was adopted July 4, di ba? Ay, it, July 4, naging independent ang Pilipinas. Okay, tatandaan natin lagi yan. Pero mamaya, magkakaroon pa ng technicalities yan. So, Article 4, no export tax shall be imposed or collected by United States on articles exported to the Philippines or by the Philippines on articles exported to the United States. Okay? So, Article 5, the value of Philippine currency in relation to the United States dollar shall not be changed. The convertibility of the Philippine peso into the United States dollar shall not be suspended and no restrictions shall be imposed on the transfer of funds from the Philippines to the United States except by agreement with the President of the United States. Sir, magkano po ba ang palita ng dolyar sa piso noon? So, ang palita noon, they pegged the value of peso 2 is to 1. So, 2 pesos equals to 1 dollar. And again, this is also a... this. A, even if people would say na, oh, this is a good thing because the Philippines <laughs> would able to have, well, the devaluation of peso or the value of peso or the Philippine currency, its devaluation para, ano, also is a way to attract investments outside. This is a good, uh, is, diba? Kasi if one dollar Ang kailangan mo uh, para makabuka ng 2 pesos dito. Imagine if you have $50,000 and magbibusiness ka dito sa Pilipinas. ba? Again, another form of competition. Kasi si 2 pesos, <laughs> ba? Mas madali sa kanya makabuo ng, si America, mas madali sa kanya makabuo ng kapital kaysa sa dito sa mga uh, Filipino business, uh, businessmen. Okay. Next, Article 7. So, the disposition, exploitation, development, and utilization of all agricultural timber and mineral lands of the public domain, water, minerals, coal, petroleum, and other mineral oils, all, all forces and sources of potential energy and other natural resources of the Philippines, and the operation of public utilities shall, if open to any person, be open to citizens of the United States and to all form of business enterprise owned or controlled directly or indirectly by the United States or Americans. So, the exploitation, utilization of... of the resources of the Filipinos were what? They are trying to extend it. But again, this against pa the Constitution, the 1935 Constitution. So, kaya may technicality dito sa part na to. Kasi it will go against dun sa, uh, sa 1935 Constitution. That's why they need to ratify it. Okay? So, mamaya, madidiscuss siya kung bakit, kung bakit meron technicality sa belt rate at kailangan pang baguhin ng Constitution. So, the government of the Philippines will promptly take such steps as are necessary to secure the amendment of the Constitution of the Philippines so as to permit the taking effect as laws of the Philippines of such part of provisions of paragraph 1 of the article as in conflict with, with, uh, with such constitution before such amendment. So when you accept the Belt Trade Act, you're also accepting what? the constitution uh, the ratification of the, uh, or the amendment of the constitution of the philippines so ano kailangan niya amend doon there's a certain provision on the ownership especially on the ownership of lands utilization of resources na uh, ano siya na reserve for the filipinos na gusto natin na gusto ng america na extend din sa mga american citizens napaka special ba? <laughs> Now, meron din daw Article 10, but I opt not to um, siguro include siya because um, it's the same nature as the uh, yung sa Article um, 4, okay, in that they should respect yung wala dapat hiya in, um, uh, they should respect the American businesses here and the power of the American presidents. So, hindi ko siya masyado din na, as hindi ko na masyado na elaborate dito. But Article 10, if you want to read it, uh, it, is, it is available in the Shirmar and Shalom okay, book. So, nandun yung uh, provisions of the Belt Trade Act. So, another is the Philippine Rehabilitation Act of 1946. But again, pag nakita natin siya, it's a good thing. Napakaganda. Diba? That the Americas would extend help for the damage, uh, that, that damages done in the Philippines during the Second World War. So you have a four hundred million dollars. Uh, four hundred million dollars were appropriated for the payment of comp uh, compensation to qualified persons on account of damage or to loss of private property. Another one hundred twenty thousand payment for the rehabilitation of public property, and another hundred 
tao, uh, 100, uh, 120 million pala, sir, and 100 million amount of surplus properties of the United States to be transferred to the Philippine government control. So, kadalasan dito sa 100 million dollar na ito ay yung mga war vessels, cannons, yung mga ginamit, yung mga jeep na ginamit nung Second World War, they were, sh syempre, mas mahal. If ibabalik pa ito ng United States sa kanila, mas mahal yung magiging gasto. So, they opted to just transfer the controls of the surplus properties to the Philippines, uh, uh, to the Filipinos, and also uh, uh, to the government. Mas maganda sana siyang pagkakitaan revenue, pero sa kasamang pala, hindi siya nagamit ng maayos. But these uh, these compensations could only be uh, could only be attained or could is will only be available if the Philippines accepts the Bell Trade and Parity. So, yung so yung kawang gawa na sinasabi dito the humanitarian reason of what helping the Philippines tinay up siya so to certain conditions. May mga conditionalities bago mo siya makuha. And the Filipinos, as we all know during that time, it's either they are pro-Americans and they believe that the Americas, um, the Americas, um, tawag doon, purpose uh, is just to help the Filipinos, eh, medyo nagkamali sila dito. Okay? Now, Ito na yung sabi natin na amendment na constitution. So, when the Bell Trade was accepted, okay, they try to, these technicalities now, because they want to insert the, the parity question. Parity. When we say parity, you're giving equal footing or equal rights to the Americans. So, may equal rights ang Filipinos and Americans sa Pilipinas, especially on business, uh, in running business, um, utilize public um, properties and at the same time yung accessibility to the resources. So that's the parity question. If the Filipinos would um, tawag doon, if the Filipinos would accept or would give or would approve giving the Americans equal rights with the Filipinos. So In his what address in the University of the Philippines, Rojas said, diba? but as I said, that war damage payment will not be sufficient to restore these industries. That is why I have established the Rehabilitation Finance Corporation. So moving on, ano sinasabi niya dito? Maka bold. Let's read it. I am borrowing from the United States and if this amendment is passed, the parity clause, I am practically sure that I'm going to get the money I want to borrow and which the country needs. I'm going to get the money from the United States to put it work here in the Philippines for the benefit of future Filipino generations and our own. Defeat this amendment and you are going to destroy the whole economic program of this government. The only program that has been presented here for the rehabilitation of our people's livelihood and our country's economy. So, may mga strings. The help being extended to the Filipinos, may kapalit. Laging may kapalit. Kaya nga, there's no such thing as, what, free. Dito sa, dito sa mundo ito, na kahit man libre ka dito, kahit sabihin mong ilibre ka ng lunch, of course, you're giving time dun sa taong yun. So, meron ka pa rin ibinibigay na kapalit. And in the economic setup, hindi rin naman papayag sila na magbibigay din ng bagay-bagay uh, ng na ganun kadali. Because that is lost for them. Economically speaking, there is the opportunity. And because the Filipinos believe that wala na siguro, wala na talaga siguro paraan para sa para ano tayo, para makaahon tayo. Though, uh, they started to give in. Dun sa sinasabi, dun sa, uh, to accept this um, unfair um, trading relations or unfair relations with the United States. But before that, This was uh, met with great, um, this was met by great, um, tawag doon, uh, resistance from the nationalists, okay? Because as we all know, Rojas, <laughs> the Liberal Party, 
<laughs> the formation of the Liberal Party and Rojas and who who supported them he just <laughs> it was the Americans who also supported the formation of this quote unquote left wing of the nationalista okay the presidency of Rojas is also what supported by the Americans because they don't want Osmeña if you want to learn uh, to learn for uh, uh, to further learn the reason why uh, Osme Enya is not really that popular to the Americans you can read Theodore Friend than doon <laughs> So the infamous parity clause So the parity clause which would grant equal footing for Americans and Filipinos ex in exploiting natural resources and owning and operating public utilities in the Philippines So there are two battles okay the battle in the Congress and the plebiscite the battle with the people So the battle in the Congress May mga makini, uh, ma, uh, makini issues na ginawa ang Rojas together with the Liberal Party to secure the three-fourths, okay? The three-fourths approval of the Congress in what? Inserting the parity clause in the 1935 Constitution. So the first thing that they did is the Filipino elites unseated the elected members of the Nationalista and the Democratic Alliance in Congress who they believe would oppose the government. Sino, sino yung mga to? For example, Recto and his allies and nationalist allies. As we all know, Recto is a staunch nationalist. Okay? And the Democratic Alliance, yung mga, mga nasa left. Okay? And including Luis Taruk. Imagine, yung mga nasa red doon, you could uh, interpret it that before, yung mga sasabi nating leftists, really, they, they 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 are willing to follow diba they are willing to follow the the procedure of what um taking us into the government that to be able to change the system diba you will use what yung legal diba yung kung ano yung nararapat which is what through election pero by unseating them by unseating these uh, members of the community, these members of the society, ano nangyari? Lalo lumala ngayon yung RIF. Okay? People would, uh, Rojas would always tell that the nationalists and the Democratic Alliance in Congress are what? They are against the rehabilitation. They are against, uh, they are against the, um, the programs to have uh, the, the programs that will make the Philippines great. Again, kumbaga kontrabida ang tingin. That's propaganda. Okay? Also, uh, Rojas and the Liberal Party offered patronage and park barrel funds in exchange for an affirmative vote. It's, not, it's nothing new. Okay? It's nothing new. <laughs> Using the park barrel uh, to control uh, the Congress. Now, they were able to secure the three-fourths votes, okay? Although, prenotesta ito ng mga nationalista sa Supreme Court, the Supreme Court sided with Rojas, okay? Now, the plebiscite. Now, after securing the votes doon sa Congress, they need the plebiscite naman. Ano naman ginawa ng Rojas, Okay. So, there are also machinations doon, hindi lang sa kongreso, pero dito din. Number one, polling places were transferred to heavily populated places. Bakit po? To limit the influence of the hooks doon sa voting. Kasi, as we all know, the hooks, malalakas yan, especially sa heavily populated areas, the central Luzon part. Napakalakas nila doon. So, para mabantayan nila at mabawasan na impluensya, nilagay nila dun sa mga heavily populated, nilipat nila yung mga polling precincts sa mga heavily populated places. And at the same time, you would see that the government is having a, what? Um, a, an aggressive uh, approach in dealing with the hooks. Okay? So the rise of the number of hooks killed from 1945 to 1946 to Masian. Okay? Also, teachers were barred to serve as poll watchers because the government believes that these teachers are uh, are biased against the parity. So 
medyo talaga ang alam na natin sa system of education, medyo critical talaga ang mga elites when it comes of educating the people, especially doon sa mga educated. <laughs> ang edukado, medyo nagalit sa kapo edukado yung nangyayari. But again, what happened? So the result, the yes vote garnered 432,833 votes which compromises 78.89% and 115,854 the negative votes. All in all, the parity clause was inserted and uh, the 1935 constitution was amended, the parity clause was inserted, and the Belt Red Act was accepted. So, what happened now? Umokay ba ang Pilipinas after the Belt Red Act as promised by Rojas? Actually, Rojas was not able to see Diba, the effects of the Bell Trade Act. He was not able to see it as an American boy, as someone, as someone who supported the Americans simula nung sa ay, simula nung World War, diba, nag-serve siya sa World War hanggang sa hanggang sa pagkamatay niya. Unfortunately, namatay siya sa US base pa. Okay? <laughs> so, he was not able to see the effects of the his uh, advocacies. But these are the effects of Bell Trade. Number 1. Philippines became a source of raw materials. Okay? So, naging, nag-ground naman tayo sa agricultural. Uh, sa ag- yung agricultural industry lang natin. So, bakit nga ba mayroong problema if um, agricultural lang ang malakas na sector na uh, sa ekonomiya? And at the same time, ano mang masama kung tayo lang ay source of raw materials? May mga problemang kaakibat na madidiscuss din sa mga susunod mamaya. Next, Philippines is a market of industrial goods. So, imbis na, imbis na ano ka lang, uh, you produce a source of, uh, you, 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 uh, first, you're just a producer of raw materials and a source of raw materials. At the same time, you're a market, you're just a consumer. Okay? Every one of us is a consumer. Okay? Kahit sabihin mo na, sir, Ano naman yun ni eh, ang ka, nagbenta tayo ng mga wood, di ba? Pero at the same time, mas murang binibenta kasi raw, pag binenta sa'yo, mas mahal. Processed eh. Okay? As what, one of my professors would tell, ginisa ka sa sarili mong mantika. <laughs> Next is perpetuation of the Philippine agricultural economy. I want, up until today. Well, sasabihin nila, this is our identity as Filipinos, but agricultural economy itself would not elevate the poverty uh, uh, elevate poverty or hunger in the philippines the funny thing about the funny thing today is that we are an agricultural economy but at the same time we are exporting <laughs> we are exporting agricultural products for other countries well sabi nila for competition thing pero okay i will discuss it further later <laughs> papaag <laughs> so the neglect and consequent debt of philippine manufacturing industries okay Competition, because of competition. Kadalasan sa manufacturing industries, ang talagang lumalaba dito sa competition, uh, ang nagiging dahilan dyan. Yung without protective measures, because the Philippines is vulnerable, di ba? And Filipino businessmen are vulnerable to what? To unlimited influx of American goods. What is happening now? Ang kinakawawa ngayon, nakakawawa ngayon is our local businesses and enterprises. So, Philippine efforts to heavy industrialization was aborted. At the same time, heavy industrialization was aborted. Okay? So, raw materials saan tayo, pero kung may kailangan tayo na, tingin tayo sa iba. People would say na, oh, that is communal. But at the same time, communal, pero gutom yung tao. <laughs> now, our relations with the United States remain on a most cordial and friendly basis. The American government is giving every evidence of its continued interest in our welfare. That is what Manuel Rojas said in his third State of the Nation address, which turns out to be his last. And up until his death, he supported and um, supported and tawag dun, believed that the Americans is really a friend to the Filipinos. Okay? Now, pumasok Quirino. So, Quirino and re-examination of the Philippine economy, bilisan na lang natin. So, in his first of the nation, a state of the nation address, Quirino said that our special relations or relationship with the United States has been productive of goodwill and valuable to our growth as a young nation. So, as we all know, dun pa lang sa state of the nation address, if you will look the state of the nation address of the people, 
you meron ka na makikita kung what would be the stance uh, or the stand of the Philippine president towards what an independent would he adopt an independent economic policy or susuportahan niya lang yung naunang ginawa so doon pa lang makikita natin that Quirino is now different from Rojas because he is willing he is willing to what to advocate what Rojas supported and what and what is it the welfare imperialism of the Americans that's why Quirino in their examination of the Philippine economy what happened during Quirino's time so there's the Bell mission so sabi nila nagtataka ngayon ng United States despite the rehabilitation aid given the Philippine economy mahina pa rin so nagtataka sila bakit mahina so They wanted to re-examine it. We all know, so sasabihin natin, Sir, masyado po atang nagiging concern na ang Amerika sa ekonomiya ng Pilipinas. But no, they are concerned with the economy of the, the, economy of the Philippines because kapag bagsak, pag bumagsak ang ekonomiya ng Pilipinas, damay dyan, pag bumagsak ang, ang Pilipinas, naghirap ang Pilipinas, damay dyan pati yung mga businesses. Okay? The businesses of... There's also the threat of the closure of American businesses in the Philippines. So, what happened? So, the Americans formed what we call the Bell Mission to re-examine the economy of the Philippines. It was led by Daniel W. Bell, so the president of the American Security and Trust Survey. So, ang kanilang naging uh, the, uh, the output or yung kanilang findings ay eh, makikita natin sa tawag na Bell Report. So, this is are just um, excerpts dun sa Bell Report. So, ano yung mga nakita nila? Number one, the large differences between the rise in wages and the prices indicated that the level of profits was exceptionally high during the period 1945 to 1949. This is borne out by the available data on corporate profits and the large volume of investment financed by retained profits in business and agricultural enterprises. These profit and the lag of wages behind prices have meant that real income the Philippines since the war has been redistributed to the disadvantage of labor and other low-income groups. Another, the mounting deficit of the government during the years of high national income and inflationary pressure is indicative of the lack of a forceful policy on government finance. It indicates a failure on the part of the government to recognize its re responsibility to levy taxes and to provide an administrative enforcement staff that can collect taxes. So one of the primary reasons kung bakit umihina economy is that there's no protective tax. So ang mga so pasok lang dito sa pasok lang ng pasok ang investments pero at the same time ano na rin nangyayari? Yan one that's one of the weakness of the economy of the Philippines. Pasok na investment, kuha agad. There's no restrictions. Walang control. Okay? So, what's happening now? Kapag lumago, kinukuha agad yung investment, nalilive agad sa Pilipinas na walang pera. Bawas. Humihina nga yung ekonomiya. At the same time, the deficit is really big. The balance of payments, they cannot balance the pay. The payments during that time, import, export, hindi rin nila mabalansa during that time. There's really a problem. Now, what are the recommendations? These recommendations were um, were listed in Salvador Araneta's book. Okay, so number one, that the present trade agreement within the Philippines and the United States be re-examined. Second, that additional tax measures be raised immediately. Yan ang sinabi nila. Tax measures be raised immediately. Mainly by increasing the portion of taxes collected for high incomes and large property holdings, the tax collecting machinery be overhauled to greater to secure greater efficiency in tax collections. That's a special emergency emergency tax of 25% be levied at or for a period not to exceed two years on imports for all goods other than rice, corn, flour, canned fish, canned milk, and fertilizer. Also, rural banks be established uh, to provide production credit for small farmers. Pero yung number seven, yung isa sa mga pinakamahalaga dito. Okay. Yung, actually, siguro dito, nakita rin nila dito na eh, pwede na naman magamit ito. 
that American aid be extended to the sum of $250 million through loans and grants for a five-year program of economic development under American technical assistance and conditioned by the implementation of the fiscal recommendations contained in the report. But again, walang free. <laughs> There's no aid na libre. There's always strings na attached doon. And ano yung strings na attached dito sa $250 million aid na gustong ibigay sa Pilipinas? So, here. The Carina Foster Agreement. So, nagkaroon ng Carina Foster Agreement. So, in November 14, 1950, the Carina Foster Agreement was signed. So, it is a measure needed to acquire the American aid. To secure the 250 million aid na nakalagay doon sa Bell Report, they must what? Approve to uh, this agreement or this measure. So, ano po po yung mga nakalagay dito? Number one, they permitted the implementation of the recommendation found in the Bell Report. But at the same time, they also put American advisors in different key government officers, especially military, economic, and the education sector or the education branches of the government. Napakalaga ng military, economy, lalo ng economic, especially the education. Even if we downplay the education system, napakahalaga ng... Uh, part ng economic sector lagi. Okay? Now, Important Export Control Act. Also, the Americans approve the the implementation of uh, controls on import and export. Bakit? Because they don't want the Philippines to ha, uh, ano dun, to reach bankruptcy. Bakit hindi papayagan? papayagan? Bakit hindi papayagan? Kasi concern sila. Of course, because bankruptcy, bankruptcy would, what they believe, would lead to the conversion of the Philippines to communism. And the conversion of the Philippines to communism will, what, in turn, uh, result to the loss of American businesses in the country. Because the Philippines has been a good market, okay, uh, for the American goods. So, napagandang market niyan. Pero itong pinaka, ano dito, one of the problems, yes, nakuha natin yung financial aid, but it was not completely disper uh, disbursed. Out of the 250 million promised, only 330 million dollars were um, were disbursed. At the same time, the money given to the government was not spent for economic purposes. It was used to support or to finance their anti-insurgency campaign. Yan na naman tayo sa anti-insurgency campaign na, <laughs> na dapat yung pera na pupunta doon sa, sa na pupunta sa ekonomiya ay eh, napupunta doon sa mga bagay na should be se second, third, or fourth priority natin. Okay? Now, Quirino. So, Quirino's fame is na uh, slightly dwindling sa mga patapo, nung patapos ng kanyang termino. Now, what happened? Okay. So, what happened? So, most vital to our internal growth is the development, however, of our trade relationships with the United States. So, the government has asked for the re-examination of the Bell Trade. So, during the time of Magsaysay, as we all know, Magsaysay is <laughs> or was put into the, the presidency, just like the other presidents. They were supported by the Americans. Okay? And what happened during the time of Magsaysay, it was the rene uh, renegotiation of the free trade. Kasi nung panahon ni Magsaysay, doon napaso yung Bell Trade Act. Now, the call for reneg renego uh, sorry, renegotiation of the Bell Trade was revived. So, the Philippine, so to address this issue, the Philippine Econo uh, a Philippine Economic Mission was, uh, was formed and Senator Jose P. Laurel Sr. headed it. So, bagsak natin ay yung Laurel-Langley Agreement. What happened? Ano naman ang nangyari ngayon sa Laurel-Langley Agreement nung re nagkaroon ng renegotiation sa free trade? Number one, there's removal to total of the total control of the U.S. President over the peso exchange rate. Okay? Tinanggal siya. That's a good thing. Check. Adjusted the import quotas towards for the benefit of both countries. Check pa rin yan. Maganda yan. Improve the preferential tariff rates for Philippine exports also. Let's check. But 
The parity privileges of the Americans was, was extended to all forms of business activities. That time, may reservations pa for the Filipinos. May, there are special business activities that were reserved for the Filipinos. Ngayon, it was open to all Americans. At the same time, exempted the Americans from the retail trade nationalization law and other Filipinization procedures. Okay? Now, this Laurel Langley was met by another, uh, was met by resistance from the formidable recto, okay? The nationalist, the leader of the nationalist crusade in the 1950s. Because he believed that all these parity rights are merely in the form, in form, certainly not in substance. Pinapakita niya na patas yan, pero actually, pag, naki, pag naramdaman mo ang epekto niya, hindi siya talaga patas. As far as those rights granted in favor of the Philippines are concerned, it cannot be questioned that there is mutuality by the wording along of the agreement is considered, but certainly there is none in actual application and practical results. The concession made to us is empty and the much heralded mutuality is nothing but a mirage. It is not real. Now, alam na natin, medyo <laughs> cut na natin to, bilisan na natin to. So, magsaysay, nakat yung kanyang term because uh, unexpectedly, namatay, may namatay na naman tayong presidente. <laughs> but he was succeeded by Carlos P. Garcia. And Garcia, medyo, ano, different na kanyang approach because he adopted what we call a nationalist approach. Well, people would say that takot kasi siya kay Recto. Because as we all know, people, especially the presidents, talagang binabanggayan ni Recto. Okay? And, peop and these politicians are afraid of Recto. And the nationalists. So, Tignan natin yung sinabi niya sa kanyang State of Nation address. Uh, address. It is clear that we cannot continue to draw on our international reserve as the present rate. But the slackening for a time of our consumption of dollars would mean either cutting down our imports of machinery and raw materials or sacrificing more of our consumer imports in favor of the industrial. The cost of economic progress constrains us to take the latter course while efforts are being exerted to explore source of new capital from abroad. We cannot expect to bring about the degree of economic improvements we we have set for our country without diverting a higher proportion of the national income to capital investments. Such a course inescapably entails our foregoing of less essential consumption and wasteful investment. That's why in during uh, uh, Garcia's term, kilalang kila siya sa tawag na austerity program, the national, uh, the Filipino first policy, uh, policy. Okay? So, mamay, di discuss kayan. Pero what happened first? These start... Ito, this is one of the reasons. This, was, this is one of the reasons why Garcia lost the confidence of the United States together with what the International Monetary Fund. They cut the rift. So, sir, what happened during the time Miguel Guaterno, the Central Bank Governor, so nakipag meeting siya with the IMF to avail what we call a stabilization loan amounting to twenty-five million dollars. But IMF, of course, will not just give that stabilization loan na parang ng pangmadalian. There, there are certain conditions na dapat, maku, uh, dapat ma meet before giving this stabilization loan. First, open the economy to imports, which means there will be minimal or possi if possible absence of tariffs. Number two, create a foreign exchange policy that is free from oil restrictions which means there will be no control over the transactions involving the use of dollars or other foreign currency. In short, the dollar reserves, pwede, napaka-accessible ng do dollar reserves ng Pilipinas, pwedeng maubos anytime yet. Next, the value of peso should be devaluated and at the same time and to implement a strict fiscal and monetary policy which is austere with welfare projects and social services and maintain highest interest rate policy. Of course, nagdalawang isip dito si Miguel Coderno. No, so, pero before pa lang nasabihin ni Miguel Calderno na nagdadalawang isip siya and he is against these conditions, the IMF already ended the discussions because nalaman nila that the United States would, who would wanted to incline doon sa decontrol rather than these, these conditions. They opt doon sa decontrol kaysa sundin ito. And Garcia doesn't want to imp uh, to impose or to implement these conditions sa Pilipinas. Kaya titignan natin his second State of the Nation address. He said, I am definitely against the devaluation of the peso. This is a measure that may prove beneficial to a handful of privileged class, but it will certainly bring hardships and suffering to millions of our people. And days before his second State of the Nation address, 
he signed Circular Central Bank Resolution Number no. 12. What is it? It, uh, it is the start of the Filipino First Policy or the reduction of the foreign exchange allocations for all non-Filipinos with exemption of the Americans. Sir, bakit exempted ang mga Americans? Kasi covered sila ng Laurel Langley Act. Okay, ang Laurel Langley Agreement. So, sa ibang mga foreign exchange allocations, nabawasan yon pero hindi nagalaw sa Amerika, yun nga, because of the Laurel Langley Agreement. Aims to ensure that the growing industrialization will be beneficial to the Filipinos by giving them preferential treatment over non-Filipinos. So, this, is, this became an essential factor for the rise of Filipino pioneers of industrialization such as Salvador Araneta, Hilario Nenares, um, um, other industry, uh, other pioneers of industrialization in the Philippines. Pero, hindi siya ganoon, uh, but this was, what? There's a negative effect naman. May mga negative, uh, may mga negative comments ang ibang tao, especially the international, um, the international body dun sa policy ni Garcia. Number one, recto, local muna tayo. Sabi ni recto, even if the Philippine, Philippine first policy, napaka-limited ng nationalism dito kasi mga mayaman lang, yung elites lang yung makikinabang dito. Pero again, this is still a good effort to impose a nationalist um, policy dito sa Pilipinas. At the same time, Hartendorp and the editor, the editor of the American Chamber of Commerce said, the slogan is not inspired by an honest nationalism, let alone by patriotism. Because as we all know, these uh, economists, these people, they uh, are against, uh, these Americans are against what? Protectionism. They will always push for a globalist approach. Okay? A globalist approach in terms of economic policies. Now, the setback to kay Garcia. Ano naman naging setback? So, the CIA was mobilized to unseat Garcia and his allies. So, nagsimula yun din sa senatorial elections. Kasi nun sa senatorial elections, they supported the Grand Alliance. Pero natalo ang Grand Alliance. At natalo rin yung partido nasyonalista ni, ni Garcia. But even though the uh, even though uh, the uh, even though the Grand Alliance supported by the CIA lost during the senatorial elections, pinakita niya yung vulnerability ni Garcia, yung weakness niya. Na ano? Pwedeng matalas si Garcia, kasi the influence of Garcia is limited. Limited, kasi natalo yung allies niya dun sa senatorial elections. And sino ang number one nun? The Liberal Party standard bearer, just dada makapagal. Okay, the vice president. So during the 1961 presidential elections, the CIA opted to support the candidacy of Diosdado Macapagal. Ngayon, kung hindi kayo naniniwala that they supported that the CIA supported Diosdado Macapagal, read these memoirs. Meron yan sa Jario, I forgot the newspaper, but it is available. Okay? So, Diosdado Macapagal, uh, nung natapos ang kanyang term, he what exposed that the Americans would always support someone who they think will support the American policies for the, and the Philippines, okay? The pro-American policies in the Philippines. So they accused the Garcia administration of rampant corruption and promised a clean government. And what? Naging effective to. It showed that the Filipinos would want a clean government rather have a nationalist government. Okay? Now, what happened after? Nagkaroon, oh, umangat, si poor boy naging president. The poor boy from Lubao became the president. And he said, during his first State of the Nation address, it is my privilege to inform the Congress that yesterday, January 21, I approved a unanimous decision by the Monetary Board. At ano po yun? To institute the first large measure of genuine control in our foreign exchange transactions since the establishment of the exchange controls over a dozen years ago. So, the decontrol na hindi makuha ng mga Americans kay Garcia na kuha nila kay Makapagal. And this is the, ito yung kapalit ng presidency. That's why they supported the Makapagal, um, presi uh, the candidacy of Makapagal. All these moves has been taken after consultation with approval by the International Monetary Fund. Okay? And guys, uh, viewers and listeners, this is the first time that the International Monetary Fund, that the Philippines felt the influence of the International Monetary Fund in the Philippines. Diba, Makapagal, uh, Garcia, hindi gumana. Pero during Makapagal, another rising monetary body 
is having uh, is what creating ways to maintain the Philippines as a neo-colonial state and it is the International Monetary Fund. Okay? Now, under makapagal's term, may tatawag tayong decontrol program. At sir, ano po ba yung decontrol program? So, through the decontrol, it fully dismantled the exchange controls, okay? Permitted the peso to seek its real level of value and, it, and at the same time allowed full convertibility with the central bank retaining only 20% of the dollar proceeds from export. Now, Mabilis na uubos ang dolyar ng Pilipinas. And as we all know, dollar reserves are, are important to the government because dolyar ang gamit natin sa pakikipag-transaction. When buying uh, machineries, we, uh, transaction, international transactions, we use dollar as an as the currency. Ngayon, mas mababa ang dolyar mo, mas mababa ngayon yung mga, mas malilimit yung transaction mo. Pero that is what is happening. The flight of capital, yung flight ng investments, capital, Pina, yung uh, flight ng capital from the Philippines outside, mas lalong naging possible. Okay? So, you will lead the Philippines again to another stage of bankruptcy. So, the 1950s na the, yung mga industrialization efforts na 1950s at the same time yung pag-angat na ekonomiya ng 1950s, it's as the brink again of bankruptcy. Ayan na naman ng Pilipinas. Also, devaluation of the peso because it tries to attract foreign investors as it reduces the cost of investing in the Philippines. Devaluation attracts foreign investors, foreign investors attracts competitors, and as we all know, competitors have the high ground sa ekonomiya. As we all know, we have the rise of the technocrats. Okay. Now, rise of technocrats. Pag sabi natin mga technocrats, these are people influential in the government that tries to control uh, that's that serves as the mouth and the eyes of the international uh, monet, uh, international monetary fund world bank united states and the philippines they ensure that the policies the policies of imf wb and us are being implemented in the philippines so majority of these technocrats are globalists okay Majority promotes what? Import liberalization and uh, in, uh, labor-intensive export-oriented strategies. Um, and at the same time, uh, the rise of uh, the technocrats also supported a an, op, uh, an open relations without uh, without uh, they are against sorry they are against protectionism. Okay, don't want any tariffs. As much as possible, free trade. Okay? Yung pinagusto nila eh, free trade. So, Marcos, pasok ang Marcos. As we all know, may mga ganong trend. Ang trend sa Pilipinas, kapag sa simula, you will be supported by the Americans. Kapag once na you realize na wala ka talaga kapangyarihan and you're just a puppet of this government, and if you try to create a different, uh, to chart a different path para sa ikabubuti ng Pilipinas, you will be met by different criticisms. Criticisms, I, you will be uh, tama, criticisms at the same time, the blessings of the powerful uh, international monetary agencies and at the same time, the powerful United States will not support you anymore. You will lose the support of these governing bodies. Now, under the Parcos presidency, the con he continued the, the control program. Okay. At the same time, ito pinaka ito pinaka talagang notable dun sa ano eh, Marcos administration, the ballooning of national debt. So in, in span of four years, the first phase from 600 million dollars to 1.9 billion dollars. Sir, bakit ba utang ng utang? Bakit mahalaga ang utang? Now, mamaya, let's explain natin. And the devaluation of peso through floating rates. So hindi na fixed exchange rate. Floating rates na ngayon. And floating rates are determined by different variables in the economy. Hindi na siya yung tipong, okay, ipapeg natin sa ganito. Okay? Evaluate natin. Siguro sa gawin natin 12 dollars, uh, 12 peso, fixed siya. Pero ngayon, fluid. Medyo volatile tong floating rates because there are many variables na titignan. Now, through this application, through this economic policies by Marcos, by continuing the devaluation, it led to, number one, unemployment rate, the rise of unemployment rate. Okay? And unemployment rate would also give rise to what we call poverty rate. Now, Marcos presidency under the martial law. Sorry, I need to, ano, to, 
to fast forward yung presentation. Now, the proclamation of the martial law happened September 23, 1972. At medyo bago yung wala naman bago nangyari, pero siguro naging mas maigpet. Hindi <laughs> pa naman ako buhay nun. <laughs> Baka mamaya may mga magalit. Now, the implementation of labor-intensive export-oriented strategy. Okay? Dito nag-start yung mga industries na pag-support sa mga labor-intensive, export-oriented. So, mag export Di ba? Uh, ano natin? Kaya manufacturing, ano dito? So, at the same time, there's a membership of SAGAT or General Agreement on Trade uh, on Tariffs and Trade. So, 1975. As we all know, yung GAT, ang gusto ng GAT is always what? To break. Diba, yung tariff and other protectionist approaches na nakasagabal sa free trade. So, the amendment of different investment laws okay, that opened the economy to, to foreign domination. For example, diba, uh, yung Foreign Investment Act. Okay? So, everything naging Omnibus Investment Act na yung application ng isa. <laughs> ng interna ng mga foreigners pareho na rin din sa mga Pilipino and yung incentives na nakuha ng mga Pilipino so nakuha rin ng mga foreigners also the Marcos presidency was um tried to what create it uh, to bolster the economy through industrialization on heavy industries pero this did not materialize kasi nga di ba against nawala yung support sa kanya because of this uh, support ng US World Bank International Monetary Fund because of this action Pero ang pinaka ano talaga dito is yung debt. Lumaki ang utang ng Pilipinas. At bakit lumalaki ang utang ng Pilipinas ng panahon na to? Number one, it's because it is, well, it is one of the weakness of the Philippine economy that they're trying to balance the payments through debt. Okay, pag-utang. So dahil laging malaki yung deficit, so to ease the deficit, laging utang ng utang. And especially the oil price shocks na nangyari. Yung two oil price shocks that happened from 1960 to 1978 heavily created a heavy blow to the Philippine economy. Okay? So, to sa first one, okay pa. Pero yung second, hindi na kinaya yon. Kaya pansinin natin, mamaya, titingnan natin dito, the macroeconomic indicators, yung shock sa 1970s, nakita natin yan. Look at the real GNP. Uh, look at the expenditure, the revenue, the inflation. Pansinin natin, ng mga 1970s, medyo controllable. Nakokontrol naman siya except 1979, 1978. Medyo nagkakaroon na ng problema dyan. Sir, bakit pa nagkakaroon ng problema dyan? It's because, ay, yung bakit umokay pa yung ano mga panahon na tawag doon kahit nagkaroon ng oil price shock. It's because debt together with American aid helped bolster the Philippine economy. Pero at the same time, because of political unrest, nagkakaroon ng problema sa politics. Again, if, you're look, if you are studying economic history, you must also know the political landscape and the, the political context and the diplomatic context during that time. Okay? Nagkakaroon ngayon ng ano, hindi pa rin masustain, okay? Yung growth na yon. So because of political unrest during that time and political uncertainty, we also lose, what, a number of investors. FDIs bumaba din ng mga panahon na yan. Okay? Ayun, 1982, pababa siya ng pababa. Especially 1984, 85, 86. Because of um, political uncertainty. One of the biggest factors is political uncertainty. So as we all know, bumagsak ang Marcos. Okay? He was unseated to, uh, by, through the use of the people power. And during Mar uh, after Marcos, there's a cause for the reform the military. So there's an armed rebellion in the countryside, challenge of agrarian reform, the future of American bases, decreased investment due to political economic uncertainty, and large debt accumulated during the presidency of Marcos. So, pagdating ng Cori, what happened? So, the, there's a continued reliance to the United States, World Bank. So, nung kanyang state, nung kanyang address nung nasa US siya, she promised a new home for a democracy and continued to fight against communist insurgency. And so, as we all know, when you say anti-communist insurgency campaign, the American ears are clapping. Okay? They are clapping. That's why they appropriated a 200 million emergency $200 million emergency aid to the Philippines. After that speech, they already, they approved the appropriation of this emergency aid. Next, economics program. So we have the structural reform and the reliance of on the private sector. So hindi lang public spending ang gusto nila. Ipasok din yung private sector, yung increase yung participation ng private sector. Kaya nga nagkaroon ka ng privatization law. Okay? 
So, number one, you have the reliance of economic aid and foreign investments for economic recovery. She also pledged, siya lang katangitanging bansa, ah. siya lang katangitanging bansa, at ang katangitanging pangulo, the pledge to pay the external debt of the country. So, hindi ka pa nga, hindi ka pa nga nakakaahon na ngako ka na agad na magbabayad ka ng utang. So, that's also hindered the progress of the economy during that time. Pero notable sa aking administration is the trade liberalization. So through EO 470 and the Foreign Investments Act of 1991, okay, she liberalized yung trade natin. So ano po bang masama doon sa trade liberalization? Ang problema sa trade liberalization is like you're taking now, a, you're entering into a different phase of trade, globalization. And hindi ka ready. <laughs> wala kang protective measures wala kang kahit anong wala kang kahit anong safety net for your own economy and who is dictating now the economy uh, the, the economy of the Philippines it is now the foreign investors na anytime pwede mo rin palabasin <laughs> na anytime the flight of capital would happen anytime gusto nila and we would leave the Philippines crumbling so the so Sige, skip ko na to. So, the PH economy after Marcos, then what happened? FVR, ERAP, and Gloria, what happened? Under Marcos, uh, under Ramos, ERAP, Estrada, and, uh, and Gloria, they continued the trade liberalization program of Glory. So, PH became a, uh, a member of the World Trade Organization, which heavily, uh, in, uh, which heavily de dealt a big blow to the agricultural sector. Okay, World Trade Organization because of their policies on agriculture. Okay, then we have the tariff reduction program and the speculative foreign capital. When we say speculative foreign capital, ito yung mga investments na foreign investments dito sa Pilipinas na pwedeng bawiin. Kaya nga, pansin ninyo nung 1997 Asian financial crisis, um, si Pilipinas wala siyang restrictive measures. Okay, bakit wala siyang restrictive measures? Yan nga, to yan nga, eh, safety net naman yan para dun sa mga investors. Now, no 1997 Asian crisis, what happened? Si si Malaysia, bakit na-retain niya yung naging maayos sa ekonomiya niya? Bakit pata pataas yung ekonomiya niya ng mga panahon na yun? It's because mahatir during that time nung bumagsak lahat, hindi niya pinigi ah, pinigilan niya yung paglabas ng investments during that time. While si Pilipinas, this what? speculative foreign investments, kuha lang ng kuha agad yung mga foreign investors. That's why if they believe that there is poli uh, political uncertainty and political, uh, uh, that the political stability, there's a problem on political certainty and stability, bawi lang basta ng pera, invest sa iba. Then, as we all know, technocrats force the government to oppose economic protectionism and industrialization based on heavy industries. So, so, I need to wrap up because time, dami pa gusto sabihin sana. But this is a long discussion. This is really a long, long discussion. And that is also a problem. <laughs> that is also one of the problems here. <laughs> that I, that from 1946 to 2005, ang daming naganap. Okay? Ang daming naganap. <laughs> And sayang yung mga data. For example, the OFW remittances, there's shift now. Dati, agricultural ang Pilipinas, pero ngayon, agro-service ka na. And it is what? Shown here with the OFW remittances. The number of OFWs now. So, dati, export lang ng Pilipinas, eh, labor, ah, uh, agricultural products, ngayon, tao na. ba diba? <laughs> Kaya nga, gusto mo mga tao dito ay maging globally competitive ang mga Pilipino. So, because someday, these globally competitive people will become, what? The, the products to be exported by the government. <laughs> Now, a supporting word for this um, for this lecture, I will like to share with you what Claro M. Recto, uh, uh, a quote from Claro M. Recto, Nationalism is nourished by a sense of history. It is of its essence to know profoundly the past so that we may be in complete openness with the men who made that history and in intimate communion with their thoughts, their deeds, and their noble lives. We always remember that History is not just a fragment of the past. It is also, uh, it is also, it is not just a part of our past, but it plays a vital role in shaping the the present. And at the same time, it gives us a hindsight of 
what could be done it doesn't give us it, the real option uh, it doesn't give us an exact answer but it could help us it could guide us to correct the ways today and in the future thank you very much That was a very insightful discussion on how the Philippines became a colonial state, Mr. Jimenez. Thank you very much. Before we continue, the UST History Society has prepared a short clip of the past events that the department has organized in the past years. At this point, may I call on Hannah Sofia Marie Domingo, the Interim Chief of Staff of the UST History Society, to introduce our second speaker. 
Thank you, Gabby. Our second speaker is a former vice chair of the Department of History at the De La Salle University, Manila, where he has been teaching for three decades. He obtained his Bachelor of Arts in History from the De La Salle University and MA and PhD major in the same discipline from the USD Graduate School. He is the project director of the annotated compilation of selected Philippine history, primary sources, and secondary, secondary works in electronic format under the auspices of the NCCA National Committee on Historical Research. He is a member of the P. Gamma Mu, International Honor Society in Social Sciences, Philippine Beta Chapter, and a lifetime member of the Philippine Nation National Historical Society, Manila Studies Association, Philippine Hist Historical Association, and the American Studies Association of the Philippines. He also developed and designed an online course on the economic history of the Philippines. He sits on the editor editorial boards of Tala, an online journal of history and Philippine social science journal. He served as an evaluator of textbooks and research projects and published in refereed academic journals and read papers in national and international conferences. Without further ado, let us welcome Assistant Professor Victor Jimenez. Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. I would like to extend my uh, gratitude to Professor Alvela and uh, the U.S. History Society for uh, inviting me and uh, participate in this uh, webinar. Uh, I would also like to commend the U.S. History Society for organizing this activity, which aims at promoting the historical awareness of the students. So let me share the screen first. All right, so then, uh, sorry for that uh, delay. Okay, so the title of my presentation is Economic Nationalism, a Healing Sub for uh, Philippine Economic Wars. So why I uh, decided to present this uh, uh, topic, uh, I took into account the continuing foreign stranglehold of the Philippine economy, the onslaught of globalization, and the ASEAN economic integration. Uh, in light of these uh, developments, I think it is imperative to re-examine the Magna Carta of economic freedom and social justice. Now, the presentation uh, seeks to accomplish the following objectives. One, uh, drawing upon the Magna Carta, this writer, or I intend to explain how economic nationalism can serve as an alternative solution to the economic malaise triggered by the United States neo-colonial maneuvers and the challenges posed by the ASEAN economic integration. Number two, to identify and explain how the policies dictated by the United States had forestalled the industrialization of the Philippine economy and impeded its development. To, to recount how the Magna Carta was framed and to discuss the principles of economic independence, national industrialization, economic planning, and economic democracy as embodied in the Charter, and 
to establish the relevance of these principles in the present time, exhorting the present political dispensation to exploit them if only to address the country's economic woes. Okay, so the, the entire presentation is grounded on the concept of economic nationalism as propounded by Alejandro Lichauco and Claro M. Recto. So at this point, the question that may be asked is, what is nationalism? And I'm sure you will say nationalism is love of country. But you know, Alejandro Lichauco says, nationalism is just love of country because anyone can say he loves his country so here it is once is that for how inadequate it is to express it you find nationalism simply in terms of love of country anyone can say he loves his country even a fool can love his country so Litapo veered from the conventional uh, definition of nationalism as love of country as, as it's already said earlier for even a fool can love history or can love his country rather and it, it does not furnish the conceptual basis for differentiating a nationalist outlook from one that is not and for understanding why nationalists take the positions that they do on a number of questions so if it is not love of country which is, which is uh, the common definition what then is nationalism for the chauco the Chapo conceived nationalism as more than a power. So nationalism is more than a power. It is a philosophy of power concerned with strategies, methods, and processes of building, developing, and nourishing the power of a state as an organic entity. So in explaining this view, the Chapo asserted that the state ought to, to, to exercise its power to, to wield its power, saying a state must consciously cultivate and amass power for itself if it is to survive and prosper as a social organism and if it is to respond effectively to the needs and requirements of the individuals who constitute it and for whom it exists. So the most important point here is that since we're talking of history, uh, since we're saying nationalism is a philosophy of power, it, it behooves the state to, 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 to exercise its power, to... to wield its power to use its power for the benefit of the people in a similar vein economic nationalism signifies the power to manage their own business to have their own steel mills their own manufacturing industries now you can see here that if we are talking of uh, political nationalism Okay. So since we're saying that nationalism is a philosophy of power, therefore political nationalism would mean that the Filipino people should exercise the political power. So if we're talking of economic nationalism here, it only means that the Filipino people should exercise the power to control, to, to manage, and perhaps to own, not just perhaps to own the means of production. So here we have, he was uh, the top was saying economic nationalism signifies the power to manage their own business to have their own steel mills their own manufacturing industries so they control the filipino people must control uh, the means of production so the top saw the necessity of building a powerful industrial base Precisely because he believed that this is the only way by which people can create their own means of production from which, from which real wealth and economic power came and without which they must forever depend on others for their very survival. So the Chapo was, was pushing for industrialization, not just light industries. Now we're just talking about light industries, we're talking about heavy industries, capital goods was talking about heavy industries, we're talking about capital industries. Now, uh, Recto shared the same view. Nationalism in the economic field is the control of the resources of a country by its, by its own people to ensure its utilization primarily for their own interests and enjoyment. So I already uh, explained that. that. The Filipino people should be able to control their own resources to to how they to control their means of production so he went on to say that nationalism and industrialization are interconnected nationalism cannot be realized and brought to full flowering without a thoroughgoing industrialization of our economy by the filipinos themselves so 
I said a while ago that the Chauco was calling for heavy industrialization. Here we have Recto also advocating heavy industrialization of the Philippine economy. So we could see here this slide would talk about or represent the interconnection relation between politics and economy. So we're talking here of the uh, political economy. So Lichaco wrote, to the nationalist economic power is political power. A people's independence and meaning is meaningless and stripped of substance unless they control the proceeds of economic decision in their own country. So this brings to my example um, the case of the KKK. You know very well that the KKK uh, had no economic platform, but it had a political platform. Okay, okay. But Pasho was uh, was uh, concerned with uh, achieved attaining or the attaining of political independence, and 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 of course the Tepero, Filipino revolutionaries were very uh, keen in uh, ousting the colonial power, and that was the same that one source of the uh, had been removed. And then, by all means, the Filipino people could uh, formulate their own programs for the betterment of the Filipino people. This also raises another question. Um, how come uh, Filipino people remained poor or have, have remained poor even after uh, Declaration of Independence in 1946 or even after the war? In other words, uh, you, you know very well that after the war, uh, we, we, we have we already achieved our independence, but we were the the, 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 how they, the Philippine political leadership started the sovereignty of the Philippines. So that's why uh, the, the the Philippine government has has yielded to to the dictates of the uh, U.S. from that time on. And of course, I I, I use historical method. And you know here, uh, you know that very well that that is a descriptive, analytical, uh, after the descriptive narrative analytical method. Okay, so the Philippines is an American colony. The Philippines remained under the control and influence of its former colonial master. The restoration of political uh, independence, uh, notwithstanding. The fledgling Philippine Republic was transformed into an American neo colony. Uh, the previous speaker, Migs, already touched on this. I think he read the uh, July 4th uh, proclamation, uh, the text of the July 4th, 1946 independence. Let me just point out that there was a difference, there is a difference between the July 4th, 1946 proclamation and the June 12, 1898 uh, Declaration of Independence. In the June 12, 1898 declaration, the Filipino people asserted the sovereignty of the Filipino of the Philippines. The, the Filipino people fought for the independence of the Philippines. On the other hand, the July 4th, 1946 proclamation, uh, you could see that the United States recognized or withdrew the sovereignty, its sovereignty over the Philippines and the independence that was given to us was just but a grant. So that's why I said here, the Philippines was transformed into an American neo-colony. And we could differentiate it, of course, from being a colony. Okay, When we say neo-colonialism, we're talking of, quote-unquote, the exploitation of a supposedly independent region or nation as by imposing a puppet government. Unquote. Or one dictionary would define neocolonialism as a policy of a strong nation in seeking political and economic hegemony over an independent nation or extended geographical area without necessarily reducing the subordinate nation or area to the legal status of a colony. So here in the United States, imposing its hegemony, imposing its influence over the Philippines, over an independent nation, and that is the Philippines, without reducing that country to the legal status of a colony. But we were transformed, we have been transformed into a neo-colony. Okay.
Okay? And of course, the, the, the superior nation uh, is known as the uh, neo-colonial power. Okay, so at this point, it may be uh, the question that can be asked is, how are we going to describe Filipino nationalism from 1946 to 1949? Okay, 1946 to 1949. So here is uh, the answer. Filipino nationalism suffered an atrophy. It is ironic that Filipino nationalism suffered an atrophy at a time when we already achieved our political independence. And it was also the time when the Americans rode high in the Philippines. In other words, the Americans got what they wanted. The United States obtained concessions from the Philippine government, namely free trade, parity rights, and the military bases. And here are the foundation stones okay, of the neo-colonial structure, the Tidings Rehabilitation Act, the Philippine Trade Act, better known as the Bell Trade Act, the Military Basis Agreement, and the Military Assistance Agreement. And, and, and MIGS has already, uh, already discussed the provision of the Tidings Rehabilitation Act. It provided for uh, rehabilitation aid in the amount of $620 million. But of course, there was a, a condition attached to the grant of the rehabilitation aid that no amount in excess of $500 would be given unless the Philippine government accepted the terms and conditions of the Bell Trade Act. And those conditions were the Bell Trade, well, the free trade and the parity rights. And then of course, you have the Philippine Trade Act, we already, we already touched on this. This provided for the uh, free trade, the continuation of the free trade between the Philippines and the United States, considering that uh, the, the United States factories were not uh, devastated by the war. And then, of course, the grant of the parity rights to the uh, U.S. citizens. And then, of course, you have the military basis agreement. You know very well you have the grant of the basing rights to the United States. And, of course, the, the, well, and the second one is the... Uh, the grant of extraterritorial rights to the uh, Americans, to the American soldiers. And the, and the principle of extraterritoriality states that uh, any erring American soldier could not be punished or under the Philippine laws. And then if you, if you extend that to the present, if you contemporize that, that that very principle of extraterritoriality was is also uh, uh, stipulated in the visiting forces agreement and you have been reading in the papers about this case of uh, uh yung, yung pinatay no ng mga sundalo but the question is mapaparusahan ba sila okay so i i don't know kung ano na ang magiging ano niya but this is because of the principle of extraterritoriality and then of course the military assistance agreement Okay, we've been receiving military assistance from the United States. And the question that, 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 that can be raised is, what is now the uh, status, the status of the uh, armed forces of the Philippines? No? Our neighbors have already developed the missile capability. No? And in the Philippines, well, according to Lichaco, has not even managed to uh, produce a decent uh, toy gun. And uh, you know very well that the Philippine government, under the leadership of President Rojas, was compelled by financial exigency to accept the terms of the Trade Act. And you can also recall that because of uh, the United States support for Rojas, si Rojas ay naging presidente. Remember the issue of collaboration. The United States uh, invented you know, the issue of uh, collaboration uh, to catapult, quote unquote, to catapult uh, Rojas to the highest position of the land and to remove Laurel, uh, who was a nationalist from the political scene. Okay, I have here a uh, slide on the continuing crisis. I think this is an this is the appropriate theme, theme for the post war period, the continuing crisis. Now, we were talking about the free trade. Uh, the continuation of the free trade under the Bell Trade Act. If you look back, okay, 
you you will recall that since 1909, I mean, under the American rule, 1909, you have the Payne Aldrich Tariff Act. That's free trade. 1913, Underwood Simons Tariff Act. The free trade. Tidings Map Duffy Act. There was a provision on free trade. 1934. 1946 to 1954, Bell Trade Act. Free trade. 1954 to 1974, Laurel Langley Agreement. Free trade. 1980, Philippine Accession to GATT. Free trade. 1995, Philippine membership in WT, uh, the World Trade Organization, that is free trade. Okay, but let me say something about the gap. No? Uh, I would like to point out here that number one, if I remember it right, it was an American official who drafted the proposal, uh, proposal uh, that the Philippines be a member of the uh, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. And the general agreements on tariff and trade uh, pushes for the uh, dismantling of the tariff barriers. So what's the big deal about it? Other countries have joined that. But you see, other countries had asserted, like if I remember it right, some countries like China and Brazil said, we will not remove whatever ban we have imposed on certain goods. But here is the Philippines removing, or how they put it, uh, reducing the tariff rate by as much as 50%. At that time, and other countries were imposing high, higher tariff rates. And another point here is that uh, since we were borrowing from the World Bank IMF, and the World Bank and uh, IMF were com are committed to uh, the removal of the, of the non tariff barriers. So you should bear that in mind. The World Bank IMF, the removal of non-tariff barriers, and the GATT, the removal of tariff barriers. So the removal of the tariff barriers plus the removal of non-tariff barriers equals absolute free trade regime. And that is bad. That would be tantamount to, I would call it, quote, uh, quote economic strangulation and So you can see from 1909, this is 1909, free trade up to here, 1995, up to the present, that is uh, still free trade under the WTO, free trade on a grander scale. So this is one, this is contemporizing the past. So the past could, under, could be understood better and for the past to have uh, 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 how do you put it, uh, a meaningful no, discussion of the past. So this is uh, in line with what Benedetto Koche was saying. Every true history is, contem is contemporary history and the Dame talking about the fusion of horizon. You bring, you bring the past to the present. Okay? So, yeah, yeah. Okay. So let us identify the programs and policies pressed by the United States on the Philippine authorities that have prevented the country from industrializing. So one, as was stated uh, already, through the policies stipulated by the Bell Trade Act, number one, the free trade provision of the Act, the Philippines shall allow the imports of U.S. goods without any limitation whatsoever, free of tariffs and any foreign restrictions. So the free trade provision of the Act had, uh, how do you put it, had uh, prevented the country from industrializing because it does, it only it only has perpetuated. Uh, the so-called agricultural economy, that the Philippines should remain a producer of raw materials and that the Philippines should remain a market for industrial goods. Okay. Ayan na. See? And of course, the influx of American goods in the country at the time undermined its efforts to institute a heavy industrialization program. And then number two, through the policies represented by the IMF conditionalities under which we have been living since 1962, when the debt control program of Diosdado Makapagal was launched. Why did Diosdado Makapagal uh, accept the debt control program? Precisely because he needed uh, a certain amount to, for his uh, administration. So... Hindi katulad ng ginawa ni na Carlos P. Garcia na they discuss the mix. Sabi nila, over my dead body, we will not, we will not adopt the, the control program. Instead, they impose, uh, I think, tax doon sa foreign currency. Kaya, 
nung nagkaroon ng election, si Garcia was not supported anymore by the United States. So, just dado makapagal na ngayon ang naging uh, presidente. So, katulad din ni Diyos Dado Makapagal, si, si Tita Glo, na isa sa, I think, sa proponent, disponents ng uh, WTO, membership in the WTO, uh, advocates ng free trade. So, President Diyos Dado Makapagal catapulted to the dictate of the United States to abandon economic protectionism and institute the control program in exchange for a stabilization loan of $300 million from the IMF. So this would entail two important uh, policies. One, dismantling the foreign exchange control. If you dismantle the foreign exchange control, it would mean massive, or it resulted, of course, it, when it, this was dismantled, it resulted in a max, massive exodus of capital and repatriation of profits. E kung gano'n naman pala, at gusto mo pala ay mag-invite ng mga foreign investors, but you allow them to to bring their capital and profit outside, uh, to, to bring their capital and profit to their respective home countries, uh, how do we benefit from the from the foreign investors? If I were them, I would I'll ask them to, to retain a certain percentage of whatever capital or whatever profit they have. Kasi you're, you're inviting the foreign investors to invest, to, to somehow probably to stimulate the economy, pero ilalabas lang nila because of the dismantling or forest control, it worked their advantage. And then dismantling of import control. When, when the import control was dismantled, the imported goods, okay, uh, reached the country in an unlimited quantities, thereby undermining the growth of the Philippine manufacturing industries. So dismantling of foreign exchange control and dismantling of import control. Then under the control program, ito na banggit na natin kanina, no? Okay, so I can skip that. The import control system was installed in the 1950s. Panuhon niya ni uh, the FIA, no? Remember, in, in 1914, by 1949, the Philippine economy was bankrupt. So walang pera sa Philippines, Philippine government, walang pang pambayad sa mga uh, trabahador, walang pabili ng gasolina, walang pera. And then, and the U.S. at takot na baka kumatok. Nandiyan na. Nandiyan na yung mga ano, communists were, were, were already knocking at the, uh, the uh, doorstep. So, sabi niya, okay, we will allow you to impose control. So, ng control, pero pag ng 1950s, nakatulong din naman yun, nakaroon ng, ng industrialization, okay, uh, nagsimula na, at least nag start. No matter what, what it may be limited, okay, in a sense, but somehow, nagsimula na ang industrialization. But unfortunately, as was mentioned, the, the import control system was dismantled and the peso was devalued. Okay? So ito na yung 1950s, eh, pinapayagan yung mga goods that, that, that goods whose importation had been banned during the time of controls to protect domestic industries were allowed entry provided the tariffs on them were paid. So, tarification naman yan na makikita natin sa mga susunod na administration din, na tuloy-tuloy din, no? Okay, here are some of the IMF conditionalities. Kasi kung uutang sa IMF, may mga conditions. Yan tawag yan strings with... with, with uh, aid with strings attached. Ang tawag din dyan ay sort of welfare imperialism. Nagpapahiram sila, okay, and, and that would of course redound to the welfare of the of the donor country. O yung nagpapahiram. Okay, so number one, <clears throat> keep the economy open to imports and foreign investments as widely as possible. In other words, no tariffs if tariffs cannot be avoided, those tariffs should be kept as low as possible and above all, no import controls. So you liberalize the, the importation of uh, goods. So paano ka magpo-produce? Kung nagsapasukan dito ang mga sapatos, look what happened to the uh, shoe industry. Di ba? Paano ka magpo-produce sa ibang mga produkto? Number two, 
maintain a foreign exchange policy free from restrictions, meaning no control over transactions involving the use of dollars or foreign currency. So kahit ano karami, sige, papalabasin yung mga pera, no? o yung mga foreign, yung mga dollars na yan. And keep devaluating the pesos. Okay? Now, <clears throat> Filipino nationalism in the 1950s, 1946 to 1949, ang sabi natin, Filipino nationalism suffered an atrophy. The Fili Americas rode high in the Philippines. Kamusta ang Filipino nationalism in the 1950s? Well, there was a resurgence of uh, nationalism. There was a reawakening of Filipino nationalism as a response to the continuing intervention of the United States in the post-war Philippine affairs. Okay, in 1968, <clears throat> the country was engulfed by the deep-seated economic crisis as President Marcos continued the debt control program. It may be recalled that he affirmed that belief in his 1966 State of the Nation Address. Excerpts. I have here some excerpts. Uh, excerpts. Let this message go forth to businessmen. Our faith in free enterprise demands that we accept the consequences of this bold adventure. Parang ang gustong sabi, eh, what can we do? Wala naman tayong pera. Di ba? So, crisis. By this time, <clears throat> in the U.S. neocolonialism was under attack. From the Constitutional Convention, number two, from the legislature, so you have the legislature, the Magna Carta of Economic Freedom and Social Justice. Number three, you have the Supreme Court, uh, the decision on the Kwasha case and the Parliament of the Streets. Now, allow me to say something about the uh, Constitutional uh, Convention. So, 1935 Constitution ang, ang umiiral. So, nakita ng mga tao doon na siguro it's about time that we change the, the Constitution, that there's a need for a new Constitution that would be responsive to the crisis. Okay, may, may, may crisis eh. Uh, so, a new constitution that could address the fundamental reasons that had kept the nation poor. So, kailangan magkaroon. So, 1971, an election for delegates to the proposed convention was held. And the following year, nagsimula na yung pagsusulat, pag -re -re ng 1935 constitution. Interestingly enough, the constitutional convention drafted a nationalist constitution. The tenor of the constitution was nationalist. In fact, the Chaco was saying that uh, based on the proposals that emerged from the numerous organic committees of the convention, it was obvious that the historic body was on the road to writing a new constitution that would be, that would e be even more vigorous in its call for a nationalist approach to the nation's problems than the Magna Carta, which Congress had enacted in 1969. The proposals that issued from the corresponding organic committees of the Constitution unmistakably pointed to a new constitution that would closely align itself with the nationalist programs of the countries in Asia. And this nationalist constitution called for the development of basic industries, called for the development of the capital goods industry, called for, in other words, they were calling for heavy industries. Number, and then it, it also a call for an increase in the required Filipino ownership of companies engaged in the natural resource industry. Remember, there is there was a provision in the 1935 Constitution on the 60% Filipino, 40% foreign-owned uh, requirement, citizenship requirement of ownership. Okay, so dito sa 1973 uh, Constitution, I um, uh, the the, the Con -Con Convention. The Constitutional Convention was proposing uh, an increase from 60% to 7%. And of course, there was also a call for Filipinization of the retail, wholesale, and import uh, business, and even a Filipinization of banking, financing, and insurance institutions. So, Eduardo Sanchez of the Asian News Service uh, described the tem temper of the convention. A strong wave of nationalism, definitely extremist in many cases, is sweeping through the Constitutional Convention in the Philippines, and the foreigners may just find themselves outside looking in, their noses hard-pressed against the glasses. 
final committee reports now up for discussion in the plenary session are very Filipinistic to a point that sharper distinctions are being made between natural born Filipinos and naturalized Filipinos. Okay, so I will not go into the details. Now, let me explain briefly or define what those heavy and capital goods are. Okay, so Lichaco had uh, made it very clear that pag sinabi natin capital intensive industries, these are the heavy industries, okay, and the, the basic industries. So pag sinabi natin heavy industries, these are the industries that require the use of heavy machinery. At pag sinabi natin basic industries, these are the industries that are identified with the production of capital goods or the means of production. So pag sinabi natin means of production, I am referring to the machinery, the industrial tools, and equipment basic or essential for the production of goods. Those that could produce or manufacture goods and provide services. So example, uh, may, may begin example sa Lichauco. We cannot produce canned sardines without the use of machinery. We cannot produce uh, shirts and trousers without the use of machinery that is needed in the making of a textile meal. You could not produce tables and chairs without using the tools such as axe and hammer produced by the machine and tool industry. So yun ang sinasabi nating mga uh, capital-intensive industries, uh, capital goods, capital-intensive industries. Okay? So, naliwanag natin. So, yung Magna Carta, maya-maya. Okay? Now, what about this uh, Kwasha case? Nag, nag, the, the, the Supreme Court uh, came up with a ruling on the Kwasha case that those American citizens who were exempted from the parity provision under the under this uh, Laurel Langley Agreement should now comply with the 60%, 40% uh, uh, Filipino citizenship requirement. So, ano nangyari doon sa parity rights? It, ang requirement ngayon, sumunod ka doon sa 60%, 40%. And then for the Parliament of the streets, you have Filipinos took to the streets. They may mga mass anti-government uh, protests denouncing uh, U.S. imperialism and, 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 and bureaucratic capitalism. So, but I will not discuss that. Ano lang yan. So, let's go to the Magna Carta. So, let's talk about the framing of the Magna Carta. Apprehensive about the escalating economic crisis entrenched in the 1962 the control program, then Speaker Jose B. Laurel Jr. did it necessary that Congress ought to adopt an organized approach to the nation's proliferating problems and resolve to provide the nation with a blueprint of basic policies that would respond to the real and objective needs of the nation. So here is Congress acting on the escalating economic crisis. So nag-respond nag, nag, nag si Con Con, nationalistic ang, ang approach nila. Ganon din si Congress, nationalistic ang approach to sa problema. Okay? So, Laurel initiated the employment of a full-time economic staff to the House of Representatives who constituted the Congressional Economic Planning Office. And that office was mandated to formulate a blueprint of social economic policies against nationalists uh, along nationalist and egalitarian lines. Laurel secured the backing of influential House members for such a noble endeavor. Public hearings were conducted to ensure the participation of as many groups as possible in the private sector. The objective, of course, being to arrive at a national consensus and not only a consensus in Congress. The blueprint was concluded after nearly eight months of continuous hearings and spade work. At the bidding of Laurel, the Congress was convoked in a special session in 1969 to ratify House Joint Resolution No. 2. House Joint Resolution Number no. 2, also known as the Magna Carta of Social Justice and Economic Freedom. So ang tanong ngayon muna, bago tayo magpatuloy, ay ano naman yung House Joint Resolution Number no. 1? And that is, of course, the ratification of the Philippine independence. So, na-ratify, no? itong 1969, itong, itong Magna Carta. President Marcos signed, bear this in mind, the Joint Resolution into a law on August 4, 1969. 
See? So in other words, si President Marcos ay amenable dun sa laman ng, ng Magna Carta. So imagine you have the executive and the uh, legislative uh, branches agreeing no, na magkaroon ng isang blueprint to address the crisis. Unfortunately, it was shelled when Marcos allowed a floating rate of the peso and declared martial law which dealt a death blow to the industrialization program. Even the 1973 constitution was set aside when Marcos declared martial law. So kung siya ay nakashell yung, yung Magna Carta, for those of you who wish to I mean, magbaging those who become legislators in the near future, you might still want to look to 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 revive no the, the Magna Carta if you are really intent in 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 uh, in solving some of the economic malaise, no? Okay. Pag binasa din yung Magna Carta, may mababanggit ya na uh, I mean, in general, yung economic independence as embodied in the Magna Carta. The nation upheld the, the primacy the, of the ideal of economic investment. Foreign investments shall not, however, be allowed to dominate the economy or any of its strategic areas. The joint resolution restricted the borrowing of foreign forms and demanded Filipino control over financial and credit institutions and strategic industries. So, pag binalikan ninyo yung, yung concon kanina, Ganon din ang, ang sinasabi, di ba? The, the Filipinization, kalagay dito. Uh, there was a proposal from the Committee on Tariff, Trade, and Commerce of the Constitutional Convention to promote the Filipinization of banking, financing, and insurance institutions. So, naka-align talaga din yan. The Magna Carta mandated the chief executive to institute a program of heavy industrialization which referred to the basic and integrated industries essential to change the structure of our economy and substantially minimize our dependence on imports of raw materials, semi-processed goods, and machinery and equipment. So, ganun din ang sinasabi ng CONCON, heavy industry. Okay? yan ang dapat gawin hindi naman talaga papayagan ng mga industrial countries kasi mawawalan sila ng supply ng raw material and market for their own goods. It went on to state that industrialization should be undertaken as a joint responsibility of the government and private sectors. The joint resolution directed the government to provide incentive and liberal financing assistance to the Filipino countries if they were to invest in desirable industries. So it really encouraged heavy industrialization. It even encouraged the grants of incentives and financial assistance to the Filipino entrepreneurs and capitalists. Now, here is a question of economic planning. The pursuit of our national objectives necessitated a planned, comprehensive, integrated, and resolute approach by the government and the people together. It proposed a National Economic Development Authority with powers to plan and coordinate the nation's economic activities. Ang pinaputo lang dito, yung gobyerno dapat mag-set ng priorities. What industries should be developed? And dapat talaga dyan, kasama yan. Pero it turned out, kasi sa iba, na hindi nabibigyan yan ng uh, uh, priority. So, doon sa sinasabi economic planning, Dito sa kanyang napapaloob yan dito sa ating uh, Magna Carta. Okay. Economic democracy, in view of the unequal distribution of wealth, the Magna Carta called upon the state to vigorously pursue a program of increased labor productivity together with measures to assure a fair share of economic rewards to labor. Democratize. So everyone should enjoy equally the fruits of uh, labor. Kasi nakakaroon nga ng uh, an equal distribution of the wealth. It, it, it enjoined the state 
to extend liberal financing to small and medium scale enterprises and cooperatives. It mandated the state to foster profit sharing between capital and labor and private enterprises and to provide assistance to destitute families deserving of such assistance. See? It's good on paper. Okay, so how do we now uh, apply it? So I'm saying that we, I, 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 I encourage, I exhort the, the, the present uh, political dispensation no? na i-consider yung mga principles sa Magna Carta. So for example, we could say it behooves the President and the Congress to take heed of the provision of the Magna Carta on foreign investments with the carefully study the devastating effects of the foreign investments of the Philippine economy. So we've been encouraged foreign, we've been encouraging foreign investors. We've been, been encouraged to uh, create an environment that was that that is conducive to foreign investors. So, ang tanong, do we really do we really uh, benefit from these foreign invest investors? Nagdadala ba sila talaga ng capital at nagdadala ba sila talaga ng technology? And then the Magna Carta proves to be important in the context of the failure of the present political dispensation to implement a heavy industrialization program which runs counter okay, to the interests of the Western powers. If the political leadership could pursue the policy of industrializing the country, it could create the means of production such as the machines, engines, and tools which could produce the limitless, unceasing number of goods. So, ang, bakit ba importante yung mga sinasabi ko, mga machine, engines, tools, equipment, etc.? Because this could produce the consumer goods. So, how could we be competitive with other countries? I, I'm sorry, no? Pero... If we've been just producing raw materials, we've been producing agricultural goods. Nagkaroon ka nga ng, ng, ng I mean, yung WTO, di ba? Yung sa ating, uh, how do you put it? Yung sa ating pagbubukas no? sa ibang bansa ng, at, ng, ng imports na yan. Eh, wala naman tayong, well, sa tingin ko, walang competitive advantage ng Philippines, a comparative advantage rather, Kasi nga, hindi naman tayo nagpuproduce sa mga consumer goods. Look at other countries like uh, uh, China. No? Involved ang, ang gobyerno sa pagpuproduce ng goods. Mga heavy industries. They could, consume, they could produce consumer goods. In so doing, it could minimize the dependence on imported raw materials. So the president can follow, follow the lead of such countries such as China, Japan, South Korea, India, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, and Indonesia which have succeeded in transforming themselves into industrialized economy. Eh, paano tayo magiging NIC, NIC, newly industrialized country? And that was the vision of uh, uh, President uh, Fidel Ramos. Philippines 2000. The Philippines will become a newly industrialized country by the year 2000. Paano? Eh, hindi naman tayo nagkaroon ng mga, industrialized, mga heavy industries na yan. The political leadership should learn from history that foreign stranglehold of the economy had not brought about uh, genuine economic development. It is high time that the Congress and the executive join forces in formulating laws that ensure Philippine control and direction of the economy. At the present time, it is incumbent upon the state to industrialize the Philippine economy on a planned basis, which entails coordination of all the programs and policies to coherent development program and efficient allocation and utilization of resources and should take an active part in the process of industrialization by providing the industries all kinds of inducement and protection from foreign competition. Kaya ba? Yun ang tanong. In consideration of the socioeconomic disparities, the Congress and President are urged to design programs that would break the monopolies. Galing. Filipinize certain industries, establish credit facilities to small uh, and medium scale enterprises, and hasten the implementation of the agrarian uh, reform program. Now, may nabanggit ako kali ng ASEAN, uh, Asian uh, integration. In consideration of the ASEAN integration, the Philippines should endeavor to strike an equilibrium between national interests and regional cooperation. As the ASEAN economic community envisaged a single market, 
the Philippine government should see to it that the interest of the Filipino people is not threatened when liberalizing a particular sector. And the government should identify and promote the competitive advantage of the country to bolster its competitiveness within the economic community. In anticipation of the competition from other member states, the government should support the local industries and businesses, particularly the small and medium scale enterprises in terms of capital and appropriate physical and technical infrastructure with a view to cushion the impact of the integration. And in summing up, the principles enshrined in the Magna Carta continue to be relevant to the present, considering the problems that gripped the nation in the 1960s still linger. The continuing crisis, remember the lingering crisis. It behooves the chief executive and Congress to formulate a development strategy grounded on those nationalistic principles. It is high time for the political leadership to advance the national interest when negotiating with the foreign power or the member states of the ASEAN economic community. After all, economic nationalism could serve as an alternative solution to the problems posed by foreign intervention and the challenge presented by the ASEAN economic integration. Thank you very much. Thank you for that profound discussion about Philippine economic nationalism, Mr. Jimenez. Without further oh, ado, no may I call on both of our guest speakers to join me for the open forum. All right, so we'll be reading questions. Oh, once again, hello to Mr. Jimenez and Mr. Jimenez. So in order to in order to avoid confusion, I will be calling Sir Joey and Sir Miggs by their first name. So we'll be reading comment uh, questions uh, simultaneously, both from Facebook and our YouTube YouTube page. So we have a question from Queer Recana from Palawan State University. Question to Sir Miguel. How do you find the build, build, build program of this administration in the train law in relation to the Philippine economy? So I think this is a personal, I think uh, this is a, based on my own interpretation of how I see it, you know. Um, maybe the build, build, build program is kind of synonymous with the infrastructural projects, okay, during the Marcos. Actually, there's a, titignan nga natin, parang, there's a big um, similarities, but uh, but I'm not uh, but I'm not saying it's the same, but si quite similarities between these um, build 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 programs and the infra infrastructure programs done in the 1960s to 1980s. Because um, although it's a good thing, na ang um, build 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 also helps with the uh, different transportation system. Trade. Ang transportation kasi napakalaga sa ekonomiya niyan. So, it could boost yung transportation. At as we all know, yung ibang mga, yung true, yung mga PPPs, yung mga private, uh, public-private partnership through them, tapos at the same time, who's also helping to sa build, build, build. Um, it creates, it, medyo nakatulong siya dun sa pagluwag eh. Kasi as we all know, yung Pilipinas, yung Manila talaga, it's something na congested. Okay. So the build, build, build helps in many ways, especially in the trade. However, I think medyo dun tayo nadadali sa priorities ngayon muna. Siguro the priorities now of the government should also be revisited. Kasi uh, maganda, sa, maganda siya actually, maganda talaga. Um, pero napaka-limited din siguro ng mga tatamaan. Okay? Napaka-limited din siya. For example, it's always kasama lagi ang Manila. Mas maganda siguro if it is not a Manila-based project. Ito, this is my personal opinion. Ha? This is not only a Manila-based project, but this is a good time also to para at the same time to boost the economy of other provinces. Especially if those provinces na talagang mabababa yung mga income sila and where there is high poverty rate. Kasi if we continue to, if we continue to perpetuate the Imperial Manila, economically speaking, hindi magbabago. Ang center ng resources, ang yaman, lagi na sa Manila lang. And sadly, ang nakakatawa dito, latest, uh, lately, sa Manila, so Manila is one of the pinakamatataas ang, ang tagdun, cost of living. 
Pero at the same time, sa Manila rin ang mga maraming mahihirap. <laughs> and, the, and the minimum wage, hindi siya tumataas. So, there's a need to scatter and to tap the resources of other, uh, and to tap other possibilities than sa Pilipinas aside from being in Manila sa entry. Okay? Yan lang naman siguro. <laughs> Great answer. Thank you, Sir Migs. Uh, our next question is from Cyril Abalos from Mabalakad City College. For the past years, what will you say about the techniques and ways of the former presidents to improve the Philippine economy? Uh, I think this is... Um, may we know who, is, who this is directed to? Or any of you can answer, sirs? Maybe Sir uh, ako na lang. Actually, wala namang pinagbago pag tinignan mo eh. Uh, from from 1946, well, I shall say up to uh, the present, uh, ang pagtiningnan mo yung mga strategies nila, nakakapit din doon sa, uh, well, sad to say, no, uh, dinidikta ng isang superior nation. Diba? Pag sinunod mo, uh, pag, kasi pag halimbawa, nangutang ka, may mga dikta eh. I, I open mo yung ekonomiya, i-devaluate ka, uh, i-create an, an atmosphere conducive to foreign investments. So, nag-improve ba ang ekonomiya? But you have to bear in mind, of course, that there is a distinction between economic growth and development. Kasi pag sinabi mong economic growth, quantitative. So, percentage, halimbawa, there is a, a, a such and such an increase in the GNP. That is economic growth. But if you talk of economic development, nag-improve ba ang standard of living? Nagbago ba ang katayuan sa buhay? Maring tumataas ang GNP, ang GDP, pero kamusta ang kalagayan ng buhay ng mga tao ngayon? Kung baga, anong naiisip ko yun, kung dati ang kumakain ka ng puro pandisal, <laughs> ngayon ba nakapagpalaman ka na? Ang palaman mo ba nag-improve through the years? Di ba? I mean, that's my, first, my take on the topic. On the question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir, for that uh, wonderful answer. Uh, our next question is from Zuria Domingo, a uh, graduate student. What's your informed opinion about self-conscious nationalist politicians like Clara M. Recta's failure to accommodate the voice of peasants and manufacturing laborers seeking social reforms, including land reform in their attacks against neo-imperialism? Do you think this is still related to Manila's relationship with Washington about the neo-imperialism you speak about or complete neglect by the nationalists who were siding with the Filipino bourgeois? Uh, next. I think this has a continuation. The question is addressed to whom? <laughs> I think it's addressed to Sir Migs. Um, uh, Oh, it, ano <laughs> uh, it has yes. no continuity. Uh, so, uh, this is a uninformed opinion. So again, personal po ito ha. <laughs> personal po ito. <laughs> so by reading, uh, by reading recto, other uh, including his uh, position, for example, uh, the his uh, his speeches, um, yung mga articles niya sa newspapers, yung uh, proceedings sa uh, Senate and sa Congress. Uh, ay, sa Congress, Senate lang pala. <laughs> diba? And yung kanyang mga conversations, yung mga memoirs ng ibang mga, tawag doon ng ibang mga nationalists and uh, about recto. Uh, I would, ewan ka, sorry ah. <laughs> but I believe that recto, one loophole, this is not a total neglect. I don't believe that this is a total neglect, but this is the weakness of the nationalist crusade during that time. Okay? First, wala namang nagbago sa trend. Kung titignan natin yung trend, the nationalist crusade, kung titignan natin, nanggaling din yun sa mga elites. Diba? These are businesses. These are elites. And at the same time, kung titignan, this is not a total neglect, but at the same time, this, uh, ang masasabi ko lang dito is that maybe Recto, okay, Recto wasn't able to detach himself from his social class. But there is an attempt. By, there is an attempt na, maka, na bumaba, na pakinggan, na siguro gumawa. The nationalist uh, idea, uh, the, the nationalist, the economic nationalism and nationalism itself, diba, ang 
ang pinaka punto niya is to uh, to harness the power of the na- uh, of the state, 'di ba? Para sa kanila at the same time kasama na doon, kasama 'yun sa pagbaba eh. Pero siguro hindi lang natin nababasa at the same time on how Recto projected it and how Recto uh, said it and how Recto uh, applied it sa kanyang mga speeches. Siguro nakita lang natin talaga mas lumalabas yung Recto bilang elitista kaysa Recto bilang nasyonalista. <laughs> So, may dualism ang recto. And that's what I believe. Ah. <laughs> This is how I interpret recto. May, do, may, may double identity ang recto. Na although, although maganda, it's a nationalist, but at the same time, there is a failure to address the laborers. Kaya nga pansinin mo, pagdating ng mga 1980s, by the writings, for example, Alejandro Lechauco, if you will look yung mga libro ni Lechauco, anong pinakita niyang plano doon? There's a plan. And what's the plan? Kasama ang laborers. Diba? Kasi nakita ng nakita ni Lechaco, maybe nakita ni Lechaco as a supporter of Recto, that there is a loophole. It is not a total neglect, but there is a loophole. He was not able to address it fully. Okay? Siguro maaring lumabas yung maaring lumabas yung elite routings ni Recto. But it doesn't mean that it's a total neglect. Or sabihin na natin tanggalin na natin yung yung ano yung, Amer- yung American ano muna. Wag na tayong pag-usapan. Recto as recto or the nationalist as nationalist. So that's it. Yun lang yung nakikita ko doon. That there is a loophole. Hindi lang siya na-address but other nationalists pagdating na 1980s because they were able to see that there is high poverty rate. Okay? There is hunger. There is corruption. And sino nag sino nagsasuffer dito? Sino ba talaga nagsasuffer? It's not already about the Filipino businesses because they were able to believe uh, they were able to realize that the nationalists were able to realize na okay, laborers, uh, uh, ano, businesses. Pagdating dito, nawala na ng trabaho. There's it's always the trend. Okay, that's always the trend. 'Di ba? Kaya nga panakip butas yung pagkakaroon mo ng mga export as labor. Panakip butas 'yon because you cannot there, there's no uh, ano yung jobs mo dito you cannot have a parang stable stability pagdating dito di ba so panakiputas na <laughs> so yun lang yun ang aking informed okay informed opinion about that one and that's my interpretation of recto okay so akin po iyon <laughs> okay akin po iyon hindi po <laughs> it doesn't speak the interpretation uh, it doesn't speak for other historians Siguro kay Sir Jovi. Hindi <laughs> rin po. Iba rin po. <laughs> Ayun lang naman po. Alright. The next question is also for you, Sir Mix. This is from Moira Iradel from the UST History Society. What are the similarities and differences of Marcos and Duterte's administration, economic status, and diplomatic relations? Thank you. Tay tayo, really. Ano? <laughs> During my ay, ano diplomatic, this is Duterte Marcos uh, comparative, <laughs> okay comparative, no, comparison pala, sorry comparison between Marcos and um, Duterte. Diplomatic, I'm not really a fan of both. Tama. <laughs> Siguro diplomatically speaking. Uh, Marcos really, di ba? Papansin natin. Siguro they both think na ano. Uh, friends to all, di ba? Enemies to none. Napaka-realist ng approach niya. Ganun yung dating. Pero, rhetoric siguro. <laughs> no. Um, during that time, siguro, the, the, um, the approach, siguro, the approach on, anong tawag doon, making friends, di ba? And using, effectively, yung cards mo. Um, there's some point na, There, there's some point na yung both administrations uses their cards in diplomatic and economic uh, uh, economic setup na okay. Pero there's a difference, sir. Saan po magpa-fall ang difference? Ang difference nila is aside dun sa rhetorics, ha? Kasi yung isa, <laughs> you, you already know that one, rhetorics. But aside from rhetorics, um, Maybe dun sa industrialization na, dun sa industrialization dream or dun sa step dun sa industrialization. Okay? Because Marcos, although, although, okay, ito ulit po ah, ito ulit. 
although many think that Marcos, uh, oh, oh naman, it's a fact. Okay, may mga masamang talaga nangyari. ba? Diba? May mga masamang nangyari, may mga masamang naidulot. Pero we cannot deny this fact that for once Marcos opted for an independent foreign policy and an independent economic policy. And that is what? The industrialization on heavy industries. That's siguro a one, th- one thing na hindi na masyado mapapansin kahit hanggang ngayon sa Duterte admin that what? There, where's the heavy industries? And up until now, we are relying heavy on FDIs. Diba? So, in business, self-sufficiency. Kasi noon, kung titignan natin, self-sufficiency ang nagiging, ano yun naman talagang dapat eh, sa pagdating sa economics eh. Ang policies diplomatically and economic, eh, economic and diplomatic policies should direct the country for self-sufficiency. Pero ang problema, nagiging reliance and that's the trend from what from after 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 the fall ng hindi ko naman sinasabi na walang reliance noon pero there's an effort ngayon kung may effort ba ang admin ngayon that's ka, that's the question there's two years na pero sa tingin ko wala pa okay sa so wala pa economically speaking ah medyo wala pa at medyo malas lang kasi may pandemic pa <laughs> And the pandemic really hits hard dun sa Philippine setup. It really hits hard dun sa uh, ano. So ayun lang po. <laughs> okay, our next question is directed to either one of you from Mark Justin Agkawili from UST Alumni Batch 2018. He asks, is there other options for President Rojas rather than accepting the United States aid for the rehabilitation of the Philippines after the war? Uh, Dr. Joey? May option ba si President Rojas? Remember that Rojas was supported by the U.S. So, did Rojas have any other option? I mean, did he, did he have an option not to accept the aid? I don't think so. Kasi nga, he was, he was, I mean, he was supported by the United States. Pinili siya eh. Kaya nga, ang sabi nga eh, uh, that paved the way, the, the presidency of Rojas paved the way for the, uh, quote-unquote, the return of the beloved and the return of the United States. And true enough, through, through Rojas, nakuha yung party rights, yung free trade, and the military bases. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sir Mix, would you like to answer the question as well? Okay, na. okay, we can move on to the next question. This is again for Dr. Jimenez. Can you cite major efforts of Philippine government on achieving a steel mill and manufacturing industry? Ah, uh, I can recall nung panahon ni Garcia. nag-stabilize na ba? Okay. Nung panahon ni Garcia, meron siyang steel industry. And panahon ni Marco, there were 11 heavy industries. But of course, uh, with the declaration of Marlo, hindi natuloy yung, yung heavy industries na yan. Then on this, well, kay Garcia, hindi rin naman natuloy yung kanyang ano, pero nagsisimula na sana. Okay. Yun ang naaalala ko. Sa ibang gobyerno, sa ibang administrasyon, meron ba mix? Parang wala akong maalala. Garcia lang and, and uh, Marcos. Privatization na sir after yung sa dalawa. O kaya nga, walang, walang heavy industries, walang uh, wala, steel and manufacturing. Uh-oh. Actually, di ba nasabi nyo kanina sir that there's a shift already. Kasi nga, yung industrialization, nagbago. Imbis na agro, Diba? Imbis na, ag- na agrarian or agro-industrial lang dating. Hindi, agro-service siya ngayon. <laughs> Kaya walang ano, heavy ano lang siya. Uh, Panahon lang ni Garcia and uh, Marcos. Yes. Thank you. Alright, so we'll move on to the next question. Uh, this is uh, from Joseph Lugtu from Mabalacad City College. A uh, question to Dr. Jimenez. Kung may neocolonialism na pong lumagana, bakit po binigay ang 1946 independence? 
well, yung 1946 na independence, yung nakasaad yan doon sa ano, binasa yan kanina ni Mings. Yung uh, naka, inconsistent with the Tynings McDuffie provision, di ba? Na ibibigay ang independence after 10 years of uh, preparation. But of course, this was uh, interrupted by the uh, outbreak of the war. Yun yun. Di ba tama, Migs? Nabasa mo yun kanina? Oh, po, sir. Yun sa, sa July 4, 1946 yeah. proclamation. July 4. Pero ano, di ba? Consistent diba, with the provision of the Tidings McDuffie, the 10-year so, transition. Oh. Yes. Oh, kasi oh, batas oh. na. Yun po kasi yun. Tenured. Batas na po siya. Oo, oh, oh. kaya oo. Oh. So talagang kailangan i-ano na yun. Siguro, sir, si, Joey, ang... Pa, na question. Baka yung iniisip nung nagtatanong sir is bakit binigay agad? <laughs> Baka po ganun. Wala mo nakalagay na bakit ilagay. Hindi, bakit ibinigay pa kung makakaroon lang ng neocolonialism? Well, siguro, nagkaroon naman ng neocolonialism after the grant of independence. Because, di ba sabi natin, ang neocolonialism is the ex, ano, ex, uh, United States extending her hegemony and influence over an independent nation like Philippines. So that's a new, ano yun, new colonialism, new colonialism. Okay. That's it. <laughs> we have a, we have another question from Melanie Magpantay, the, addressed to Dr. Jimenez. Does NEDA intend to use the provisions of the Magna Carta you speak of for economic planning? It is not a panacea, but a clear guide for our economic planners. I, I hope that the NEDA would be guided by the provisions of the Magna Carta. It may not be on the panacea, but it could be a, really a blueprint. Sana buhayin nila. No? So kung si Ms. Melay ay magiging uh, senador no? in, the, in the near future, uh, she could revive the Magna Carta. But uh, let it be said na dapat eh, matibay ang loob niya. Kasi I'm sure, I mean, kung matutuloy, ang pag-revive doon sa Magna Carta kasi it will be met with opposition, of course. Okay. Thank sir, you, Ms. Melay, for that wonderful if question. Government offices, no? <laughs> if government offices will not be, uh -oh. if will they will adopt a nationalist approach rather than a globalist approach, uh -oh. it is possible. But I'm sure hindi mahihirapan. It, it would be a Herculean uh, task kasi masasagasaan mo yung interest ng mga uh, mga neo-colonial powers unless mag-assert ka talaga ng independent foreign policy na ginagawa as claimed by Duterte ginagawa niya no? alright okay um, if we, have, we, have, we have another question for from Elijah Gabriel Flores addressed again to Dr. Jimenez hi Dr. Jimenez is it still possible for a resurgence of Philippine economic nationalism? How can you make it more properly contextualized to effectively move people towards its objectives? Siguro to, 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 to move the people towards its objective, to, to educate them, to, 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 to make them study the history of economic, uh, economic history of the Philippines. Resurgence of economic nationalism, Sa ibang bansa, meron ako nababasa, meron. Meron sila na ibang, ano, di ba? Like si Trump, di ba? Sa ibang bansa, no? ganun din ang ginagawa ni Trump. Inu-oppose niya, di ba? May nabasa ako doon. Inu-oppose niya yung, yung membership ng US. Isang nakalimutan ko yung pangalan nung, nung uh, grupong yun eh. Uh, isa yun. Well, dito sa kaso ng Pilipinas, di ba, nakikita nyo naman how, how, Mar how, how, United, uh, how, how Duterte has uh, expressed his view regarding the, the United States. So it's, it's all, it all depends kung mag-a-adapt ka ng, ano, ng uh, nationalist approach doon sa economic problems na yan. Pero it's really a, a, a challenging task, I would say. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Jimenez. Uh, we, uh, next question is from Dan Gabriel de la Cruz from DLSU Manila. Again, addressed to Dr. Jimenez. 
Sir, do you think that the concept of economic nationalism in the Philippines failed? Or is it still too early to tell at this point in our country's time? economic nationalism niya, di ba? Nagkaroon ng, ng pagsisimula ng, ng mga industries. Although, kinikriticize that it was, these industries were still dependent on imported raw materials. But, ayaan mo sila kung, kung dependent on raw materials. Ang, ang sinasabi dyan, nag-attempt ang Garcia administration na magkaroon ng industrialization. Yun naman ang importante. Uh, hindi ko alam ano yung second question niya na dyan, ni Dan. Ano? Okay. Ano pa yung so Miss Gabby ang palagay dyan? It's too early to tell. Uh, uh, okay. Is it early okay, to tell you. at this point? Yeah, in this country's time. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. Yes, sir. Do you have, some, do you have anything to add pa po, sir? No more. Uh, no more. Uh, uh. Okay. Thank you. All right. So all. we have one more uh, room for uh, uh, one more question. Um, the questions that were not answered in today's uh, open forum will be tried to be uh, answered by our uh, speakers via email. So for our final question, is from Jejumar Palma. A question for Dr. Joey Jimenez. Sir, the, res the resolution of both houses, number two, proposing to amend certain economic provisions to the 1987 Constitution was filed on July 18, 2019. Do you think, sir, that the proposed amendments contained in the resolution echo the spirit of the economic nationalism that the Magna Carta for EF and SJ espoused? Salamat po. So I think uh, Dr. Herman is uh, experiencing, I think he disconnected. Oh, then he's back. Okay. A am I disconnected? Yeah, you're back, sir. We can hear you now. Would you like, a, would you like us to repeat the question, sir? Yes, please. May we please flash the question again? Okay, there we go. From Again, from Judge Omar Palma, do you think, sir, that the proposed amendments contained in this resolution echo the spirit of economic... Na oh, I think he disconnected again. I think we're having problems with Dr. Jimenez's uh, connection at the moment. Sir Mix, would you like to answer this po? while waiting? Uh, sir, I think you're on mute po. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. May I read yung first, yung first part? Nandun ata kasi pinag-alala. Can we go back to the first? Yeah, sure. Can we go back to the first? <laughs> All right. Answer. So the resolution of both houses number two proposing to amend the certain economic provisions to the 1987 constitution was filed on July 18, 2019. Okay, then if if this uh, proposed amendments contain the, uh, no, the resolution echo the spirit of economic nationalism that the Magna Carta for EF and SJ is passed. I'm not really, uh, no. I'm, uh, I'm not the... Uh, um, I'm familiar with the resolution pa. <laughs> so I cannot give my ano, I cannot give my opinion. I'm sorry, Mr. Pan. Okay, I think Dr. But, Joey is back, sir. Are you able to oh he, he disconnected again na po talaga. Um, yeah, so uh so ayun, maybe if I could if if I was I will be able to read it siguro uh later. That's a good uh, info for me, in fairness. But I will, uh, maybe I will try to revisit it later. The information on the said resolution. Okay. okay. Uh, Dr. Jimenez is, uh, Dr. Joey is back. Uh, sir, are you able, well, do you, would you like us to flash the question? Judge Omar, I'm sorry, ano yung EF and SJ? Baka initials siya na, ano? 
I'm not sure either, but that that was his. Um, that so was the resolution of both houses proposing uh, was filed on July. Okay. So ah, okay. Do you think the proposal? Ano ngayon? Sorry, dapat kami sa EF. Uh, Judge Omar, what is this EF and SJ? Kami to amend the constitution, di ba? It's not reflective of the economic nationalism because they want to liberalize, di ba? The the committee, the the Congress is 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 uh, keen on liberalizing the economic provisions of the 1987 constitution. Liberalization siya eh. Unless i- iba yung meaning ng EAF. But, but from what I've been reading, ang move ng Congress uh, is to liberalize uh, the economic provisions of the Constitution. Uh, he mm-hmm. answered, sir, Magna Carta for economic freedom and social justice is what oh, So hindi nga siya ano, hindi siya, hindi siya ano, kasi yung, yung proposed amendments ngayon, these, these are not these are variants with the uh, with the economic spirit of the Magna Carta. Kasi yung sabi ko nga, yung, yung move ngayon ng Congress is to liberalize the economic provisions of the Constitution. Ibig sabi, mas mapadali pumasok yung mga foreign mga foreigners, foreign involvement, gano'n. So malayo, hindi, hindi siya, I, I mean, the way I see it, Jojo Mar, thank you for that question. So that okay. question finally ends our open forum. I would like to thank our guest speakers for this event, Mr. Miguel Antonio Jimenez and Assistant Professor Victor Jimenez for making this event possible. At this point, may I call on Judy Francesca Montejo, the Interim History Society President and the co-head of this webinar to award the certificates of appreciation to both of our speakers and finally say her closing remarks. On behalf of the UST History Society Executive Board, I award these certificates of appreciation to Mr. Miguel Antonio Jimenez and Assistant Professor Jose Victor Jimenez for being research speakers in the UST History Society's webinar titled Charting Progress, the Philippine Economic History During the Post-War Era, awarded on the 27th of April in the year of our Lord 2021, held online. Signed by the project head and president of the UST History Society, Judy Francesca Montejo, and the chairperson of the UST Department of History and advisor of the UST History Society, Associate Professor Archie Diaz. Thank you, Mr. Miguel Jimenez, Assistant Professor Jose Jimenez. Good evening to everyone. For my closing remark, I would like to say that words would never be enough to thank all of you for making this event possible. To our resource speakers, Mr. Miguel Antonio Jimenez and Assistant Professor Jose Victor Jimenez, to our Master of Ceremony, Gabby Seguera, to my co-project head, Calista Bravo, to our professors, Assistant Professor Emmanuel Jarek A. Aldela, and Associate Professor Archie B. Reses, and to all the people behind this webinar. I could not mention you all one by one, but please know that I am very thankful for all the efforts you have exerted to make this event possible. To wrap it all up, we have learned a lot from this day's discussion. I hope that the learnings that we have here would continue to inspire more and more people to have interest not just in Philippine economic history, but all aspects of history in general. Organizing this kind of event is very fulfilling because I know that it could help in making people's minds to be more critical in this contemporary time. Once again, with a grateful and overwhelming heart, I would like to thank everyone. God bless and good evening. Thank you so much, Ms. Montejo. Before we end, please do not forget to accomplish the evaluation form in order to get an e-certificate after the event. The link to the evaluation form will be emailed to all registered participants, and each e-certificate will have a QR code to check for validity. To formally end this webinar, may I invite the viewers to join us in singing the Faculty and Arts and Letters hymn and the USD hymn. Once again, this has been Charting Progress, the Philippine Economic History During the Post-War Era, and I am Ana Gabrielle Seguera, your Master of Ceremonies. Thank you, God bless, and stay safe.
Carved from the mighty rock of faith, shaped by traditions of old, steered by God's guiding hands towards farther shores of our dreams. Fitful vessel on the high seas, searching undaunted and free. Resounding in one hymn of praise, life long and more brimming full, tempered by his gentle hand, the seas do sink blue in a distant white, the mind strong, reason in the heart's delight. We Tinkers after truth, and ever give for sweetness and love.